I believe we're live, Chair. It is now streaming. We're ready. Good evening, everyone. This meeting of the Historic Districts Review Board is now called to order. Melissa, may we have a roll call, please? Yes, Chair Rios. Here. Vice Chair Guida. Here. Member Aguilar Medrano. Here. Member Berkeley. Here. Member Beachside. Here. Member Bienvenu. Here. Member Larson. Excuse. Thank you, Madam Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any changes to the agenda? Staff or board members? Chair, there are no changes. Is there a motion to? Rita moves to approve the agenda as submitted. Side seconds. Roll call vote, please. Member Aguilar Medrano. Yes. Member Berkeley. Yes. Member Beachside. Yes. Member Bienvenu. Yes. Member Guida. Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you. We have minutes of February the 14th, 2020. Any changes to any of these board members? Uh, yes, Member Aguilar Medrano. Thank you, Madam Chair. On page 11, the last paragraph, second to last sentence, if you can change it to read, the applicants are claiming it does not have enough space to function as a residence, and yet their plans, and then it can continue as it was already stated. That's all. Thank you. Any other changes, board members? Uh, Member Benvenu. Thank you, Madam Chair. On page 11 as well, the middle paragraph, the sentence that begins, he felt certain if this had come before the board for designation. After the word designation, add with the additions now proposed, comma, and then continue with the sentence. And on page 15 in the motion, after the semicolon, where it says, and three exception criteria that have not been met, Add the words finding that the between and and three. And that's all I have. Thank you. There are no further changes. Is there a motion to adopt the minutes as amended? Guida moves to approve the minutes as amended. Aguilar Madrano seconds. Uh, roll call vote. Member Aguilar Madrano. Yes. Member Berkeley. Stain. Member Beachside. Yes. Member Bienvenu? Yes. Member Guida? Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you. We have six uh, findings of fact and conclusions of law. Any changes to any of these? It appears we have no changes. Is there a motion to, uh, to adopt these? Guida moves to approve. Side seconds. Roll call vote, please. Member Aguilar Medrano? Yes. Member Berkeley? Yes. Member Beachside? Yes. Member Bienvenu? Abstain. Member Guida. Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you. Matters from the public. Anyone on Zoom or here in the room that wishes to speak? We have a one person coming down. My name is uh, Rick Martinez, 725 Messia Road. Members of the H Board. Uh, I'm here for ask you for some kind of help from you guys. You know, I know that's what I'm talking about. The project is on the west side of St. Francis Drive, but it's an acequia that was destroyed, completely wiped out. And I've been trying to get uh, uh, the minutes from, or the whole packet from the Planning Commission Final Development Plan and from the, and the archeological report. I still have gotten nothing. I've asked staff many a times, requested that, that we, that we that I get a chance to look at them. I still have not been able to look at them. The Aseca is completely destroyed. I mean, it's not there anymore. It's uh, the Aseca, there's Los Pinos. The neighbors around the, the whole place have been asking for 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 help, but uh, it doesn't seem, it doesn't help. This as excavation started back in, in October, and, and I noticed it in uh, probably the first part of April, uh, February and called and still has done. There's even a red tag on the Aseca. Nothing like that has happened. So I'm really asking you guys for your help. Maybe you guys could help me. So help me talk to staff, have them help them send stuff to me so me and the public will know what's going on and what the next steps are going to be. Right now, we're just lost. So my email is Martinez at Yahoo. My phone number is 983-5643. And if you guys can help me, just give me a way that I can get out there and reach out and get maybe get staff to come, come in and really show me what's going on. 
because it seems like staff is is working with the developer, not working with the public. And that's one thing I do, and I, and I, look, I always look forward to you guys being a voice of the historic parts of Santa Fe and, and keeping uh, Santa Fe historic. But this is on the west side, so I think we still matter So for that stuff. So I thank you so much. So Rick, hold on. Who is the authority that overlooks the Asikias? Uh, it's it's Phil, but it, it it's Phil Bove who's who's to the Mara de Madiama, but it, but it's still it's, yeah he's the mayordomo. But mayordomo, who yeah, is sorry. the actual authority? Heather, is it under the city, the auspices of the city, or do you know? Um, we've been investigating this, um, and I haven't been able to get the archaeological review committee um, packet to Mr. Martinez. My apologies. Um, but the Archaeological Review Committee reviewed the Asakia and the concerns about preservation of the Asakia. It is a lateral to the Asakia Madre. It's Asakia. Asakia is the Pinos. Medio or? Medio is Los Pinos. Is Los Pinos? Okay. So um, we are planning on going out tomorrow on a site visit. We have been working with the builder on. Um, you know, options, but we have made no decisions and we'll be presenting it to the Archaeological Review Committee on Thursday. They meet at 4.30 on Thursday. Yeah, but that's something I do. And and here's uh, one report from the Archaeological Committee. This was dated June 7th, uh, 2018. It says, all, all resources will, should, will be, should be avoided during the development activities and no impact on these properties should exist. I mean, it says right there, they should never even been on the, been doing that. But for for two months, this is multi developers. They, that property was there. We went to a neighbor. We went worked with really worked with the, the other the, the buyer of the property. Then he turned around and sold to Polte. Polte has turned around and says, "We bought the plants. That's the way it is." And it's a fuck. But I'm, once again, they they started in in uh, in October, and I didn't report it till three, two or three weeks ago to them that it was done. It should have been a red flag a long, long, long time ago. I mean, this is three months already, but I'm sorry, but I just, I need to find some way to get it because I don't think I'm getting anywhere. So Rick, you indicated that there was a portion of the Aseca that was destroyed. Is this on this property that you're talking about? Yes, it is. It, or is it uh, beyond this property it's, as well? It's, it's in the middle of the property. There's two Aseca, it's called those those, those Asekas. One's for the, uh, the Los Pinos and the, what was the other one? And the Aseca Mother is up further, in the medio, yeah. So there's there's laterals that go through all this stuff that were supposed to have been protected. So, but you know, I'm just what I'm saying is that I don't get no help as, as far as as far as making sure we observe to see how this how how it's going to be redone or if it's going to be redone. That's another question. Heather, did you want a further response? respond to that we have been studying um this issue and i made david eck the chair of the archaeological review committee aware of it on monday i met with him we don't have we've asked polte to provide some solutions you know potential solutions for the asakia to go to the archaeological review committee i i won't be able to make that decision the arc has to and so that's why we haven't gotten far on that. And as to the inspections, we don't, I hate to say we're so siloed, but with the inspections, those are handled by another division. Um, I was not aware the city engineer had been talking, starting to talk with them about that issue. And it only came to my attention when Rick called me. So that's where my involvement started. It's also not on the agenda for the, for the archaeological community. I looked at it too, this week. It will be under staff communications. Okay, well, I'm just hoping for help. And if you guys can help. Thank well, you. hopefully, Rick, it'll move in the proper direction. I hope. Uh, so. I don't think that this board, unless a project came before the board that had uh, an Asekia on it, uh, they couldn't. No, I realize that, but, I, but I did come for you. As prove a, anything as to your, be built yeah. on the Asekia, but. Yes, I know that's out of your preview to to to, the, to that because not in the historic districts, but I just I'm looking for help. That's all I'm doing. Yeah. This is just and I'm glad that you brought it. This is a good place to bring it before uh, a public body so that you will get City some not next some attention and help. Yeah, but no, I thank you guys. I just wanted to say that. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Yes, Heather. And last week I did meet out on site with Taylor Pardue, and um, he's also one of the neighbors that is concerned 
about this. So I have actually been to the site and Paul Duran, who is an archeologist is going to be helping with the, the um, conversation with the archeological review committee and the restoration of the, of the site. Yeah. So Thank is you. it possible that the public can join in on your site visit tomorrow? Um, sure, I can make arrangements okay. um, with you. I'll call you. Yeah. Just, I want to be part of this issue because I've seen this happen. It's happened to me on the Secas de La Hoyas. Same thing got destroyed there a couple of years back. And uh, we, we found a remedy for that. But uh, a big developer like Pulte, I don't know if we're going to find a remedy. It's so. Thank you, Rick. Anyone else from the public wishing to speak at this time? And uh, Chair, we do have Stephanie Bernardo who would like to speak. Okay. Stephanie, you may unmute. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, I still want to talk about um, the city resolution um, that Mr. Rubelied, um keeps talking about, uh, resolution 2009-20, about voting <clears throat> on boards. And manner of voting. Um, first of all, it says voting privileges. Committee members shall have the privilege of voting on matters or questions before the committee. Voting shall be conducted in the following manner. A majority of the members shall constitute a quorum. Each member, excluding the chair, shall have one vote. The chair votes only in case of a tie or when his or her vote will provide the necessary member number of votes required by law for taking action uh, on an issue before the committee, such as adopting minutes. Um, and then it says, when a quorum is present at any meeting, the vote of a majority of members, I wanna read that again. When a quorum is present at any meeting, the vote of a majority of members present shall decide any questions brought before such meeting and uh, except when extraordinary majorities are required to, as determined by Robert's rules of order. So um, again, there is no voting members in here. There's no le uh, reference to voting members. Um, this is not about uh, uh, the number of members except those who abstain. So the chair is necessary for a quorum. If you have only four, that means a majority of the members present, okay? That means all members and the chair is a member, doesn't say voting members, and the chair does have a vote, but it's limited. So again, four in the quorum, the majority is three. I'm pointing this out because you have now done, I think at least three votes in which there was not a majority voting. This is a, a procedural problem because somebody could actually challenge it because you did not have a majority of the quorum present, the number of members present uh, to actually vote for whatever it was. So again, I'm reading you the actual language. It's simple and clear. I'm you sure. don't add words. You simply uh, apply what is said. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Anyone else uh, on Zoom? No one else? Yeah. Thank you. Um, anything under staff communications? I do, uh, Madam Chair. Attorney Rubelli. Thank you. You may recall at the last uh, regularly scheduled HDRB meeting, the question came up about uh, the uh, project to restore the obelisk or some uh, monument in uh, the plaza. Um, I believe uh, Member Bienvenue uh, asked about that. And the question was whether or not that would uh, be presented to the Historic District Review Board. Uh, my, I discussed this with my boss, Aaron McSherry. She indicated that there is not a plan to present the um, uh, obelisk reconstruction to the Historic District Review Board. Um, however, I did want to bring to the board's attention that it is that there is not a specific design uh, planned yet, and it uh, the decision seems to be in its intermediate phase. There has been a resolution that has been drafted by 
uh, or sponsored and drafted by counselors Carol Romero Worth, Chris Rivera, Jamie Cassett, Amanda Chavez, Renee Villarreal, Michael Garcia, and Mayor Alan Weber. Uh, that more or less addresses the issue about the Plaza Monument. The resolution is called a resolution directing the city manager to take next steps based on some of the recommendations of the chart report. Now, the chart committee is um, an, anachronism, an acronym for culture, history, arts, reconciliation, and truth. And the committee has um, made recommendations to the city manager. Uh, and the, uh, those have been, this resolution has been reviewed by, introduced to the governing body February 8th. Then it went to the Quality of Life Committee, it went to the Finance Committee, went to the Finance Committee yesterday. It will go to the Public Works and Utilities Committee March 6th, and it will be presented to the governing body on March 8th. The caption for that is a resolution directing the city manager to take next steps based on some of the recommendations of the chart report. You'll note that nothing about Plaza Obelisk in that caption. So if you're trying to follow the Plaza Obelisk issue, you need to look for next steps on recommendations of the chart report. And that is on the governing body agenda for March 8th. Um, what uh, Ms. McSherry has told me is that if you wanna be heard on this matter, please participate in the governing body um, hearing on March 8th. You're also welcome to contact any of the counselors or the mayor directly. Um, the resolution, just so you understand, the resolution doesn't necessarily say what's going to be placed in the plaza. It is a resolution to have the city manager hire conservators, designers, and or historians to determine specific proposals, demand, redesign, and reframe the obelisk as follows. One, use original pieces to show the lines where the obelisk fractured by bonding it together with a modern contrasting material. Um, display an interactive interface such as a QR code and contemplate updates to four plaques described in the resolution. Further resolve, city manager shall recommend the appropriate budget and placement for an office of equity and inclusion, which as I understand will make the final decisions on that and probably present them to the governing body. The four plaques to surround the obelisks are, one, to describe the complete history of the obelisk as the soldier's monument, two, to contain an indigenous land acknowledgement, three, restate the Entrada proclamation dated September 7, 2018, and four, describe the events that led to the obelisk destruction and pledge a commitment to healing and reconciliation. Um, so again, there's no specific design other than the city manager will formulate this committee to hire designers and so on and so forth. Um, if that resolution is passed, um, but again, look for the recommendations of the chart report presented to the governing body on March 8th and recognize that uh, the resolution is essentially to direct the city manager to um, enable this to go forward and with further design uh, to take place pursuant to that directive. Um, uh, but again, there is there is no plan at this time to present that to the Historic District Review Board. Thank you, Gary. Any comments from board members? Member Benvenin. Uh Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, uh, thank you, Frank. As you know, my question last time was just whether or not the city's position had changed as to um, because we did understand previously that this would come before the board before any alterations were made or decisions made. So you've answered that question, which I appreciate. I think it's uh, incorrect interpretation on its face of the code, um, which specifically provides that no alterations, demolitions, new construction shall take place in this district in anywhere subject to public view from a public street without approval from the historic board. So anyone who's dissatisfied with this decision will certainly have an appellate issue. And I don't think it's adequate to say that we could make our voices heard because then we would be speaking as individuals and the process is specifically designed for this to come through normal procedures to the board as a whole with staff recommendations. And, and I believe member Bienvenu, you can communicate that to Ms. McSherry. Um, that's just after uh, inferring with her 
that's what she reported to me. Right. Appreciate that. And, you know, and as I said today, when we were talking in the long run, uh, perhaps it's a moot issue because this to me is a decision that ultimately should be made by the governing body in the, as a final decision. It's just my view is that the law clearly requires a step where it works its way through this body as well. Thank you, member from the new uh, Heather. Uh, Chair Rios, I would just like to make the board aware that um, Historic Preservation Division staff was not involved. The first time that I knew of this resolution is when I saw it in the paper. So I um, just want to put that on the record that we had no input on this issue. So um, moving on to another issue is uh, Carly Picarello is with us on Zoom. And she would like to speak as a member of staff on communications. Harley? Man mute. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. Um, I've had the great privilege of serving the community and um, and uh, working with you all and getting to know you over the past year and a half. And um, uh, over the last uh, few months of my maternity leave, I've uh, realized how uh, grateful I am for this time uh, that I've been spending uh, with uh, my new son. Um, and I have come to the difficult decision that um, I've, uh, I am uh, resigning from my position. Um, uh, before I uh, finish my maternity leave. So um, I know you all are in wonderful hands with Heather there. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll, uh, she'll be moving on to um, uh, next steps on uh, finding a good replacement. But I wanted to, um, I sent an email earlier out today, uh, but I wanted to make sure I um, could announce this publicly. And, um, say uh, how grateful I am to have spent um, uh, the last year and a half uh, being able to work with you all. Well, Carly, wow, uh, this is a surprise, but I can understand that you'd want to stay home with your children. I think that's also a good road to follow. I want to thank you for your service and your uh, your service with the city and you working so closely with the H board. I think you're a very competent person. And I personally, and I believe I speak for the rest of the board that we all enjoyed working with you. And I wish you the best of luck with your family. Thank you. If anybody else wants to Thank say anything, you're welcome to. Member Thank Bimby. you, Madam Chair. Just a second. Um, the chair's comments, uh, Carly, good luck to you. We appreciate everything that you did. We're sorry to see you go. And I hope that all your future endeavors are as successful as they were here at the city. Thank you. Thank you, well, good Thank luck. you all. I, um, I, um, uh, I hope to be involved in some of the, um, as a, at least uh, as a member of the public and uh, these, uh, the exciting times with the, at least with the code change and, um, and maybe this next meeting on the obelisk um, uh, at city council. So uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Carly. So many thanks to Carly. She was a great resource for me, just stepping back into historic preservation and um, really helpful. I can't blame her. I did the same thing, I decided to stay home with the kids. So certainly a worthwhile investment for me and I imagine will be for her. So. We all, as staff, wish her the best and hope she won't be an, a stranger as well. We'll look forward to seeing her. Well, good luck. So uh, did you want to, I wasn't here for the last meeting, but did you want to introduce Paul uh, Rudon? Certainly. Actually, this is his first week, Chair Rios. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in fact, his second day. And so, Paul, if you could come to the podium, please. So... Paul Duran comes to us. Um, he has worked in the past with the water department as an archaeologist. He was consulting archaeologists on their projects, their infrastructure projects. And um, so his background is archaeology, but also he has lots of experience with grant writing and, and certified local government 
activities and programs. He's worked in Hawaii as well as in New Mexico, and we're very fortunate to have him. That's for sure. Do you want to say anything? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Paul Duran. I'm from Santa Fe. Um, Madam Chairs, uh, committee members. Um, super excited to be here. Um, I love my job as an archaeologist. I love working in historic preservation. Um, and wherever I can best facilitate my skills, my traits, whatever I have to offer, I am here for, for the city and for our public, for our community, however I can best do that. So you just point and I'll do. Thank you, Paul. Well, we welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're very fortunate. That's for sure. No other staff communications. Uh, we will move on to old business. Prior to moving on to the first case, I uh, I will uh, talk to you a little bit about the appeals uh, process. If uh, you disagree with the decision that this board makes, you do have the option to appeal to the city council. And that process would take place after the findings and the conclusions have been approved. And also, if you are a member of the public that wishes to comment on a case, uh, I will limit that to two minutes. And if Melissa or one of the, uh, Melissa, can you help me on this on the two minute limit? Thank you. So we will move on to the first case, which is Carly's case, and that's located at 50 Mount Carmel Road. Yes, member. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um Lord Medrano. I, I will need to recuse myself from this case. It's my understanding um, that I can sit and hear the case out, which I'm happy to do. If you'd prefer me step out, I can do that as well. I, it doesn't matter to me. Okay. It doesn't matter to me. Any other board members have an objection? She will, um, Member Aguilar Medrano will not be participating in this case, but she does have the option to uh, sit in the room and hear the case. So Heather, may we hear from you, please. Thank you, Chair Rios, members of the board. Um, I'm bringing to you, this This is a case that you may recall have, has been heard once before. Uh, there were concerns that were raised by the board at that time. And so um, this is for the last piece of the Mount Carmel um, renovations that will be heard by the board. And it is for a masonry wall. You may re recall that this is located on the western portion of the campus, but um, not at the end of Mount Carmel Road as the public right of way, but through and up to the driveway, which is about 500 feet um, between the right of way as well as uh, and the, the gate itself. So it is considered an interior um, type of wall and gate. And so that has an impact on how the height is calculated. So if the board may remember from experience, but it's, it is the code, the code requires a circle, a 300 foot circle in order to do the measurements. And the wall has to be lower than the highest um, yard wall that is in the area or within zoning. And so the highest yard wall is approximately seven feet and so but the zoning only allows six feet so the six feet dimension would be what would be allowed or permitted at the site so this is a, a view up towards where the the entrance gate and masonry wall will be there will be pedestrian gates the wall itself will not actually touch the buildings that in between um, fatima and, and the convent itself and here's a comparison of, of the two um, different proposals. So you can see the previously it was a seven foot tall metal gate. And then the wall itself was approximately six feet. And then stepping down eventually to um, there, the pilaster was stepped down to the four feet. Um, and there has been a redesign so that the metal gate itself will be six feet tall. And then the wall it will step down to four feet, six inches. And so the pedestrian gates themselves will be also approximately four feet, six inches. And here's a detail of that drawing to just illustrate the relationship with the, um, the buildings themselves. You can see the masses uh, that are sketched in and the wall as it relates to those buildings. 
And so therefore the recommendation of staff is that it complies with the general design standards. Um, we will defer to the applicant to provide additional information on the metal gates. We didn't receive anything as of yet, but they said they'd be bringing material to the commission or the HDRB for their review. And, um, and we defer to the board, staff defers to the board pending this information on the metal gates. That concludes Thank my you, presentation. Heather. Thank you. It looks like Lisa is coming to the podium. Hi, Lisa. And if you can swear her in when she gets right to the mic. Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. Lisa Gavioli, 130 Grant Avenue. Um, hold this and switch. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> okay, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. I think what I'll do first sorry, is Just pass around these material samples so you can look at them while I'm speaking. We're happy to be back before you this evening to go through. Oh. where I am, <laughs> um, to go through the proposed wall and gate design one more time. So as you recall, um, this is the, the view of the main LA towards the chapel through the, through the central campus. Um, this is approximately where the entry drive will end or will, will curve to the north. And again, we're in, this is the originally proposed um, entry gate and wall, um, and there is no change in, in the plan view. So this, this plan view remains unchanged as originally proposed. Um, we are reducing the pilaster width. We have, we have made a minor change to the pilaster width to make them be more in scale to the reduced height. And this is that what was originally proposed and um, the reduced design here with the, the highest pilaster being six feet, six inches and the, the adjacent wall um, stepping down to four feet, six inches with the maximum height of six feet for the gate, for the primary gate. Um, and, and again, this is an alternative um, pilaster width, if it pleases the board, um, to, to reduce the width of those pilasters. And just as a reminder that this, the inspiration for this gate design was, uh, it's a design that John Gamim used um, fairly commonly through, throughout his work. Um, so the earliest photo that we have of this design, 1928-29 from the La Fonda Hotel. And there is another example on the campus um, from the Immaculate Heart of Mary Chapel, which was built in 1962. Um, this is just a, a detail rendering of the, the gate showing the, the detail, the, the elements of the design and a section of it. And this is a, a 3D mock-up of that, just to show that there is some relief in, in the gate itself. And you'll see the material going around. The material would be this, this weathered steel. Um, maybe I'm not using the proper term there. An antique steel. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so we don't have a full mock-up of a panel, but we do have the material for you here. And this rendering shows that it will not just be a flat surface, but there will be relief. And, and really the goal is to have it have it blend as, as well as possible into the, the historic elements of the property and the neighborhood. Um, and was there anything else? No, I think I'll just stand for questions at that point. Board members, uh, member Guida. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, Lisa. Um, uh, thank you for sharing the material uh, sample and these renderings. It gives us, I think, what we were looking for last time um, in the way of, uh, of of what the actual gate material was going to be and what the proposal is about. Um, if I may ask, what is the material for the pedestrian gates? It's the same. Same. And will it have the raised panel design as well? Okay. That's the, that's the idea. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? It appears not. Um, thank you. I think this is a better solution, personally. And uh, yes. And um, so I congratulate you. And also thank you for the renderings. This does make it a lot clearer for our eyes. Thanks. Yes, member Benvenu. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry to interrupt. Um, Lisa, thanks for the revisions um, and the additional information. Uh, I'm glad that uh, the, the wall I find perfectly acceptable now, I always did actually. Um, the height of the gate is still high to me, but I think that you're within your rights to do a six foot high gate here. And I'm glad that you brought it down to that. Um, and I note that there is a privacy gate at the monast at the, uh, I don't know what we call the building next door that's not part of your building, but it is about six feet high, I think. Monastery. And I, so I think that's somewhat fitting with the character of the property, even though it's odd to me still that it's straight across the entryway as it is. I think that's unfortunate. But again, I think you're within your rights to do that. I still have the, the major problem I have, I guess, is twofold. One is the material. And the second is the lack of any fenestration. And um, I, you know, I just think I have to still say that I think that the drawings, they just, I don't know if you have someone that can testify as to how those, how the drawing was made that shows the chapel being very visible above the gate, but I just don't see how that could possibly be the case. I think from any angle of approach and from any mode of transportation, whether walking, biking, or in a car or a horse for that matter, um, you will have that probably the entire doors, if not higher, blocked from view by the gate. And I just can't see any way that that elevation drawing could be accurate. So that's my major concern. Um, I just, you know, our fence guidelines do um, suggests that it's always better to have fenestrated gates. I think you could have fenestration on this gate, at least on the upper half, and still meet the issue that you've raised, which is you don't want headlights um, beaming into the property at night. And um, so I think that would be a better solution. But if it has to be solid, I I would I just think it would it has to be made out of wood or at least a steel frame with wooden elements because I just think that this metal is completely inconsistent with anything else on the property. I don't believe there's anything that's that that's characteristic of any other detail in anywhere else on the property unless I'm mistaken. Whereas there is a lot of wood detailing. So I think that this design in wood or um, a steel or metal framed gate with wooden elements within is something that I, with all the other changes you made that I would find acceptable for this, but not the solid metal. Thank you. Madam Chair, Member Bienvenu, just to respond to a few of your comments. Um, this drawing was made based on elevations that were surveyed in from finished floor of the chapel and, and from the elevation at the gate. So this is a rendering. This, I mean, it, obviously it's a two-dimensional two drawing. So it's never going to be exactly a, a represent, representation of how something looks in real life. Um, that, that said, 
um, we did study the view shed quite extensively in, in determining how um, and whether to make any alterations to the design. And I can show you, oh, the, there's another example. So this is standing, not exactly sure how far back, 30 feet from the gate. Um, and it all depends on where you are. So for instance, this is a sight line through the property to the chapel. Um, this is from the west, standing at a person standing at the west property line looking towards the chapel. And although this might be um, hard to see, maybe I can zoom in. Um, this indicates that that even at the at the farthest distance, you will be able to see the entire mural above the doors of the chapel. Um, and then coming a little closer, again, you'll still be able to see the entire mural because it hits just a little bit above that. So obviously, it depends on how far you are back from from the the actual gate. Um, with regards to the materiality. I can I can think of numerous examples of metal gates throughout this district in particular, which is the review district. Just wanted to remind everybody that we're not talking about downtown and east side, although I can think of numerous examples in the downtown and east side as well of metal gates. I don't think that this is an inappropriate material. Steel has been used for centuries <laughs> in, in Santa Fe. And so I I, you know, and this board themselves has already approved metal gates elsewhere on the property. Um, so that, that's just my response to your concerns. In reference to fenestration, did you have a comment? Obviously our preference is to not have fenestration or because it, it, it diminishes the purpose of the gate, which is to provide privacy for the guests. And um, that, that said, I do want to make a slight correction to, to a statement that I made the last time I was before this board and that although the, the campus is technically a closed campus. These gates will be open for things like special events where the public will be will be invited to the property. Um, and so th these gates will not be remain, remain closed all of the time. Um, but while, while retreats are in session um, in any other time except for events in which the public is invited to the property, they will remain closed. Um, with, with the goal of not only preserving the, the privacy of the guests, but also helping to separate the uses between the Carmelite Monastery, which as you know, the Carmelites um, enjoy strict privacy um, and, and the retreat use, just to really help enhance um, each, each user's privacy um, in that regard so that we can be good neighbors. So would you remind us of the width of the gate and also the width of the pilasters? Sure, Madam Chair. The The width of the gates is 20 feet, and that is for, um, for emergency access purposes so that the gates can be opened for emergency access so that that LA can be used as a fire lane to help help serve um, emergency access for the, for the buildings on the campus. Um, the pilaster... The reduced pilaster width that you're seeing here is four feet, two inches for the pilasters that are immediately adjacent to the gate. Um, and as proposed, they were five feet, six inches. So, so quite a bit wider. Any other questions or comments? If not, if this, is there anyone from the public wishing to speak in reference to this particular project? I don't see anyone raising their hand or coming forward. Is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, there is. Um, first, Stephanie Beninato and then Adam Johnson. Stephanie, Thank you. And please, those people will be sworn in and they will li be limited to two minutes. <gasps> do, you, <clears throat> do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. Stephanie Beninato, PO Box 1601, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I am in support of Member Bienvenue's comments about, and um, some indication by 
uh, Chair Rios for the need for fenestration. I think that it's very massive looking and um, I think that the, the center square in each of the panels could be open and you would get a, I don't know, I think it would just be more appropriate. Um, the whole thing of somehow that there's gonna be all these lights coming into what is basically an open courtyard. Um, if it's in retreat, then, <clears throat> excuse me, they're not having public events. And so who's coming and going at, in the dark? And um, so that's uh, not really well explained or the need for that is um, not really there. Um, and I wonder where else on the campus the board did approve uh, metal gates and what they look like. Because um, I think, again, that's important. I also think really the pedestrian gate really does also need fenestration. I would find it very off-putting and kind of unfriendly if I came up to a gate uh, that was all metal, no opening. I have to go through it to actually know what's on the other side. Um, again, I, I think for pedestrian safety to come into a courtyard, it might be nice to get a little view of where you're going. So maybe um, that could be considered as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next person. Adam Johnson, you may unmute. Adam Johnson, PO Box 1055-87508. Thank you. Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so I, I think this is an interesting debate. I, I've been following this project for a long time. Um, you know, I, as the director of the old Santa Fe Association, um, the modern elders invited us out to the campus and, um, we have been quite impressed with their, uh, proposed renovations and, and I admire this work a lot. I think the, the wall and gate have been improved significantly. Um, you know, I, I like this, uh, the illustration of the elevation and the view shed drawings that Lisa showed at the very end were, pretty illuminating for seeing the chapel from a distance uh, and imagining the wall in that place. Um, so, so I think that <clears throat> it seems okay to me. Um, I, I also, and I maybe the applicant can uh, answer this. I, I think that the gate would resonate with the, the proposed grading that will be placed on one of the windows. I forget the building's name, um, but it's probably Northeast, the mo Northeastern most building. Um, and, and I hear the concerns about fenestration, but ultimately I think, I think that the way that the site lays will, will actually allow for enough viewing into it. So I, I'm personally in support of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? No, Chair. Board members, if, yes, Member Beachai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, Lisa, for explaining and sharing so the introspective mission and purpose of this property and as well as that of your neighbors. I think that's an important thing to remember when talking about fenestration and privacy. Um, I, I um, also appreciate you all reconsidering the height in light of last the last hearing. Um, I, I think I understand the, the preferences for the five foot six inch wide pilasters. And actually, if I may, the the preference of, of my client is actually the four foot two oh, inch wide pilot. Thank you. It's the less massive of the okay, two. Okay, thank options. you for that clarification. And I assume based on the last hearing, Hunter mentioned some um, uh, need to balance the the extreme width of this gate with um, with the wall and the height. I hope that that achieves or maintains that objective. Um, and I might have missed it in the packet, but I did not see the width specified in the drawings. Is that width of the of the pilasters? Four feet two inches. Okay. Is that in the drawings? Just to make sure that we have that on the record. Um, I don't think it's dimensioned, but it is a scale drawing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I would be happy to submit revised drawings if 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 it pleases the board to approve this four foot 
require less to risk. It doesn't seem like it's necessary, but I appreciate that. Thank you. Board members, any other comments or questions? Madam Chair, I'll make a motion. Yes, Member Guida. Uh, case 2022-006113 HDRB, address 50, Mount Carmel. Um, move that the board approve the project as submitted, noting that the applicant uh, is uh, proposing a four foot two uh, pilaster width on the on the wall. Uh, otherwise approve and, and will submit revised drawings to staff. Uh, otherwise approve the packet as submitted. Sir, second. Beach, I will second that. Thank you. Anything further to add to the motion? Nothing further. Uh, roll call vote, please, Melissa. Uh, Member Berkeley? Yes. Member Beachside? Yes. Member Bienvenue? No. Member Guida? Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. We appreciate your attention. We will move on to new business. And the first case is Angeles. It's located at 1564 Canyon Road. Good evening. I am going to ask if the applicant is pre present first. That would be Preston Bastardo from uh, PPC Solar. And seeing none, I'm going to move to the next case first. Unless I guess that's your choice. That's your call. There's <laughs> a motion to uh, have this first case, 1564. Uh, Move down the agenda. Uh, Guida moves to move this case to the end of the agenda. And the new seconds. Roll call vote, please. Uh, member Aguilar Medrano. Hold on one second, please. Member Berkeley. Yes. yes. Member Beachside. Yes. Member Guida. Yes. The motion, member Benvenu. Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you. Then we're going to move to the second case on the agenda, which is located at 239 Johnson Street. And that's your case as well. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is at 239 Johnson Street in the downtown and Eastside Historic District. You have reviewed this property in early January when you designated primary facades, um, of which the uh, west facade was so designated. This application is for a uh, ramp to be um, not attached, but up against that, up against that wall. Um, the other part of the proposal is for the, on the north elevation, which was non, not designated primary facade, to uh, replace an existing door um, that is in the lower photo to the left. Um, with a wider door to make it um, accessible for uh, various mobility devices. Um, and that's the proposal here before you. These are the elevations. There's no changes proposed for the south elevation or the rest of the building. And this is the floor plan that shows um, the ramp in plan above and as well the ramp details below in perspective. The ramp itself will run north and south, north, south to north, and um, the slope, uh, like I said, will be unattached. There'll be a nine inch separation between the west elevation and in the actual ramp. It'll extend across that, a portion of that west elevation. And the ramp itself will have a dark 
brick red surface. It'll have wrought iron vertical members, which will be painted brown. And the north, let's see, that's the facade diagram from before, but I've already indicated that you're just looking at one primary sod for the ramp and the other one, the north side, uh, with the widening of the door. The door will be the same design. It'll just be widened to 36 inches. And with that, uh, staff recommends approval, finding that it meets the, the general de design standards for all H districts, as well as the downtown and east side just design standards. So I stand for questions. Board members, any questions for Angela? Clarification. Here's not. We'll get Chris Purvis, who's presenting this evening. I'll we'll get him to get sworn in. You swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. Christopher Purvis, 518 Old Santa Fe Trail. Hi, Chris. Do you have anything more to add to what Angela just told us? Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. No, she presented it. Questions for Chris, board members? It appears not. Um, Anyone from the public wishing to comment on this particular project? No one? Anyone on Zoom? Yes, um, Stephanie Beninato would like to speak. You may unmute, Stephanie. Okay. Um, thanks. I, I, I have no objection to the concept of what's being proposed, but I, I find the drawings, and maybe it, it's just on Zoom, it's hard to see them, but I find the drawings of the difference in the doors on the north elevation, for example, not to be particularly uh, noticeable. And also where the ramp is, it looks like that window that's closest to where the into the building the ramp goes to, it looks almost like it's longer um, than it is in the existing. So um, I would hope that you could ask for some clarification uh, about that, like what's the existing door width, what will the proposed door width be, you know, just be a little more specific um, because the dimensions are not noted. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Anything further, uh, board members, or any other comments for public, from the public? No? I will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion, Madam Chair. Uh, Case 2022-006-281-239 Johnson Street. Uh, I move that the board approve packet or the project has submitted. I hear a second. Side seconds. Each side seconded. Roll call vote, please. Uh, Member Aguilar Medrano. Yes. Member Berkeley. Yes. Member Beachside. Yes. Member Bienvenue. Yes. Member Guida. Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you. And thank you, Chris. Thank you. Our uh, next case is located at 408 Camino de Montesol, and Ramon will be presenting. Good evening, board members. Um, this is... Um, A pretty substantial house, um, and it's got a great history to it. I'll just give you a brief rundown of the background. It's a 408 Camino del Monte Sol, single family house. It's in the downtown historic district, and it's a contributing property. Um, the applicant is requesting primary, primary facade designations. Uh, the house was built in 19, around 1924. By an associate of John Gamim, um, Hugo Zellner. Uh, the second story of the house was uh, added by Frank Applegate later in the 20s. Um, some unique aspects to this building is its very thick um, adobe walls with deep recesses and uh, buttresses at the corner. Um, it's a fine example of um, Pueblo Revival style. So uh, you can see the location there. It's like right in the heart of the historic district, Camino de Monte del Sol and uh, Aceque Madre. Uh, this is the east or the north elevation. 
Asin Sekia Madre. The south elevation, which has been modified by um, some type of intervention, maybe in the 70s or 80s with this uh, large sunroom. The east elevation showing the battered walls and um, the kind of consistency of the massiveness of the building. And the west elevation. Here's the floor plans. Um, on the right is the first floor, and the left is the second floor. The elevations. The relevant code citations are. 14-12 contributing structure and 14-12 primary facade. So in this uh, facade diagram, it's indicating um, the east and the north elevations as primary. This case was brought before the board in 2018 and it was post, it never went any further than that. But uh, it was staff's recommendation at the time that um, the east and the north elevations were to be considered. Okay. Um, I had a better primary elevation diagram, but I think it got, somehow got lost. But that's what we're looking at right there. Um, do you have any questions for me? Ramon, is um, the address to this is Camino de Montesol. Is the main entrance actually on the Camino? Or not really? No, it's that's what I thought. And uh, looking back at the history, I couldn't I couldn't find exactly where the original entry was. It looked like it was facing a safety and not, but I think that's lost to history. Some people have suggested that it was even to the south, uh, as its neighbor's building was similarly oriented to. The Other questions? Uh, about Member Aguilar Madrona. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ramon. I'm wondering if you can maybe clarify something. I'm not sure if I'm reading correctly. It's in our packet as page eight. They said no. It doesn't have applicant happen. presentation. Oh, that's okay. Public hearings. <laughs> Board discussion. Motion. No, that's okay. Um, the page itself doesn't have a number, and it's at the end of the New Mexico Historic Building Inventory, but the part I was wondering about is it has the status listed as S for significant. In your research, in this case, have you ever found that there was a recommendation for it to be significant or I'm guessing it never was in the past, but I'm just confused at why this portion of the report has it listed as S. Yes, I'm a little confused about that also. Um, I'm not exactly sure where that came from, but we've got it listed as contributing and verified as contributing. Okay. Um, Chair Rios, Member Aguilar Madrano, that, that what we surmise, I checked with Nicole Thomas on this, is as possibly from the Camino de Montesol um, study for the National Register nomination that was done, and um, but the significant status was never adopted. Though the district was established, um, the local jurisdiction of the city of Santa Fe didn't okay. specifically adopt it as significant at that time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ramon, would you describe for us the south elevation with all the glazing? And when do you think that was added? That, um, to me, is contrary to the rest of the house. This would be complete 
speculation, but I would say in the 70s or early 80s for that kind of sunroom with the Vegas protruding out and the second story. Yeah, that tree is kind of hiding it, but it's got a lot of glass right there. It has a lot of character too. It's pretty interesting actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, Member Berkeley. So I do have a question about the south elevation and something we discussed today on the field trip and that I myself have just noticed generally in that area is although it kind of stands out from the style of the rest of the house, it is something that's kind of consistently seems to have been done to many houses in that area. Correct. And of that sort of time, yes. 70s, um, for solar reasons. And I'm wondering just staff's thoughts and maybe even the board's thoughts on what this is starting to feel like historic and primary maybe when in the past it might not have. And I'm wondering if it's, if anyone had any comments on that. I will leave, I will defer to the board for that and answer to that. <laughs> but yes, you do see adaptations from that period of time to many historic houses in this district. Um, this one is kind of unique because it's uh, tucked away to the south side and you don't really see it from the street. It's not very visible. Board members, you have thoughts in reference to this or any other portion of this project? Member Guido? Um, uh, just in response to Member Berkeley's uh, inquiry, um, I, I kind of like this addition quite a lot. Um, the Higby seems to suggest that uh, improvements, maybe the addition, were imminent in 1983. So that I think brings us a little bit closer to a date that makes sense. Um, Yes, I mean this is something of its time. We see uh, in the in the ordinance um, for certain districts uh, a recognition of passive solar architecture. Um, I don't know that we specifically see it in the downtown and east side historic district, but we know that there are buildings from this period that that um, speak to that movement that was important in the southwest and important uh, in Santa Fe at the time. It was seven oh seven Palace, the condos there. Or a notable example of that, uh, of of a kind of continuation of the Santa Fe style that's sympathetic to the district while doing something new and creative. So, uh, you know, I'm always excited to see this. Um, uh, you know, but I, in light of the fact that you know we're not at 50 years, and, and um, I'd probably advocate for um, the Asakia Madre facade. Um, as being the primary facade. Any other comments, Member Benson? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I think this is something I I was just going to defer to the applicant because I think the applicant has some background information. But to me, the whole issue in this case is whether or not this should be a significant structure, um, not just a primary facade designation. Um, to some extent, just in, in some respects, it seems obvious it should be significant. I mean, the the association with this being one of Frank Applegate's original efforts to create this a style in the 20s is extremely significant. It's an amazing example of that to this day, from the especially from the facades you've pointed out. Um, the back, I think, is beautiful as well, but I don't know if it's historic or not. So the issue to me about significance is, does it retain a high degree of historical integrity? Because that's the requirement for significant status. And I, at the, the packet sort of indicates that the answer to that is no. Um, and I would just like to hear from the applicant when it's uh, the applicant's turn to present, if they can walk us through what they understand to be the changes that were made and when and what evidence there is for those changes as opposed to speculation, that could be very helpful. And if we don't have enough information, uh, this might be a case that needs to be deferred for HIPPY. Madam Chair, members of the board, um, to <clears throat> directly respond to Member Bienvenu, I've been looking, and then you can look very carefully at the two Hickfeys, which really give you the 
the current history of the building. Previous history of the building, I think two-story structure and designating the north and the east elevation makes sense. It's looked like that for well more than 50 years. But all the windows were changed in the 80s, which you can actually even see on the Asequia Madre side. If you look carefully, especially the upper two middle windows, they've changed shape. Um, I took pictures from the inside. So they've, the windows have changed, but the massing has stayed the same. On the other hand, there's a reference in the, in the second Higby that basically says the sunroom was enlarged. Now, that's where I get the fact that that uh, solar, solar addition was pushed out, presumably, and the glass was changed. Certainly, the, the, I took a picture of a, um, a light that was manufactured in 1986, put on that south elevation. So while I agree this, the massing of the building has basically unchanged, can't imagine that wall, that wall that kind of goes like that. Because they had done it any other time but the 80s. Um, I don't even think the 70s did that. That's my interpretation of, of the history of the building. And, and I think the Hickbys tell the story better than, than anything else that we've heard. It certainly was an old building. It certainly, and I think it, it did contribute. There was that 1980s a survey of Camino Monte Sol to designate it um, in its own right. So it's it's a, a subset of the historic district that the state looks at, and that's where that status comes from, as I understand. Are there any um, drawings, paintings, photographs of what this looked like? prior to the change in the sunroom that you're assuming took place in the 80s? No. Of the south elevation? No, unfortunately, the Hickby only addresses the north and the north elevation, I think, is what's all that shows up in the 80s, uh, not the south elevation. I have, I have pieces of lumber and, you know, photograph of a light, but it's more that all the other windows were changed at the same time. So when you're inside the house, it feels like one that was remodeled in the 80s in terms of the, the way the windows were changed in terms of the other stuff. Although I believe it'll have come to the board, I wish that those records still existed. That would answer that. Right. So it's more <laughs> like a reference to it in the 91 picture that makes me say that. And what what would you imagine having been there when in that south facade when Frank Applegate added the second story before this was pushed out as you think? What do you think the south facade looked like? Can you speculate from what the interior is like? No, because it's been pulled. So it's a two story space right now, and I can't imagine that that that's the way it was. I bet it was. Um, you know, I had a, maybe you had a portal or something extending. Now I'm really guessing. So right. Shouldn't be doing this, but it it it's a mo you know a modern space inside there because it's two story and the there's a kitchen there that's held back away from that elevation or the elevation was pushed out in that direction. Okay. There was a garage, you know, if you read the first stuff that was on what I would interpret all the way on the Asakia Madre side then got French doors and then got closed off. So it kind of relates to that part of the house. And um, one other point, Cecilia, you mentioned the, the front door. There is a front door that faces Montesol. Oh, there is? Yeah. Now, how much people use it, the parking's all on Asakia, so they tend to come in that gate that hopefully you all went in to see the south elevation. There is a front door. It's, it's a nice front door but it's hidden around behind bushes. So Chris, you mentioned that the windows were changed and actually having been, having lived on Camino de Montesol or even in the eighties, I wasn't living on Camino de Montesol, but my parents were. And I do remember a lot of renovation taking place for, uh, I remember there was not a wall there, even that short wall. 
it was it didn't exist and they did reno do a lot of renovating so did they change the openings of the windows from what no? i can tell they changed them a little bit but they didn't i mean from my contributing status they they shrunk one and lengthened one the ones that i can see maybe they widened them a little bit so I don't see that they changed them, but, but in today's parlance, they changed them. They were a little bit narrower, a little bit wider than they were. But in terms of the way we used to look at a window, the window's there, they just made it fit the new manufactured. Uh, and do you know anything about the color of the windows? Because I think that changed. I think it was, they were darker. I would throw that to you. Yeah, it wasn't I, the <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't. I wouldn't I want to chip swear, it the, I didn't but, chip it. The window. but I do recall this house going through a renovation period. Yeah, and it was significant. You go inside, and you can. It's all of a piece. You know, the tile work, plaster work, paint. Any other questions or comments? Appreciate that. Anyone from the public uh, wanting to come? And here comes John Eddy. You swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please state your name and address for the record. My name is John Eddy. My address is number 14, Avenida Campo Verde, Santa Fe. 87506. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, board members. I would like to uh, join the camp of the people that do remember this house in the 80s. There are two of us in the room. So, so you lived on Camino as well? <clears throat> yes, I did. I did. And I agree with you. A lot of changes happened in those years, in that decade, and probably after that. I think what's important with this house is the massing. And status goes you could make an argument that it should be significant because frank applegate impacted this house so strongly applegate did a second story on a house further up the camino across from 555 which was william penhallow henderson house that's a very distinct two-story building much as this one is i'm not suggesting that this has to go to significant because there have been so many alterations made on the building, but I'm very grateful that Applegate's history is tied to this building and it is recognized. So uh, good luck with this one. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment on this particular project? Anyone on Zoom, Heather? Yes, um, Chair Stephanie Beninato would like to speak. Stephanie, you may unmute. Uh, thank you, Stephanie Beninato, PO Box 1601, Santa Fe 87504. Um, I think that the staff recommendations for uh, significant or for primary facades are the ones that should be followed. I do think the solar addition on the back could have been improved. I wonder if any if there's any record. Um, that that addition was uh, allowed as an exception in the 1970s or 80s uh, when it did happen, um, that kind of thing. But I, I, I think that that, if you can't date it to 1973, that you can't um, really consider this significant in that, I mean, in that there is this change and there's some other, as I think Chris Purvis pointed out, sort of utilitarian slight changes because you're gonna buy the standard size window and you're not gonna spend the other whatever they would have charged at that point to make it more custom um, than it was. Or maybe you, you realize that they had put in a, a newer frame and you could put in a slightly wider window, which also happened. Um, so anyway, I hope you follow staff recommendations I would love to, to be significant. Um, if you want to talk about that more, great. Um, but I would hope that at the minimum that you would follow the staff recommendations. Thank you. Anyone else on Zoom? No, Chair Rios. Member Benvenu. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll make a motion if whenever you're ready. We're ready. Okay, in case 2023-006352, HDRB 408 Camino de Manesol. Um, I would I wish this could be a significant building. I believe it's significant in my view, extremely significant. I don't, however, think that the record as it's been presented supports a significant status today um because of the fact that all significant alterations were made and i don't think it any longer has the high level of historic integrity that is required under our code for a significant status um, and of course a significant status would mean that every facade was primary including the recent additions relatively recent non-historic additions on the south facade which really doesn't make a lot of sense so um, for that reason, I would move that status be retained as non as uh, contributing and that the entire north facade and the entire east facade be designated as primary and uh, with the exclusion of the non-historic windows, but including the window and door openings. So second to this motion. I have a second. Anything further to add? Okay. Um, roll call vote, please, Melissa. <clears throat> Member Aguilar Medrano. Yes. Member Berkeley. Yes. Member Beachai. Yes. Member Bienvenue. Yes. Member Guida. Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you. And thank you, Chris. We'll move on to the next case, which is located at 208 and 208A, Gonzalez Road. Angela, your case, please tell us about it. Thank you, Chair, members of the board. It's coming out here soon, 208 and 208 and a half, Gonzales Road. Okay. Um, 208 and 208A are non-contributing to the downtown and east side historic district. Um, they are built in a Spanish Pueblo uh, vernacular style uh not known exactly when it, it when it uh originally the original portion was built but they show up first on the santa fe county uh records in the 1960s um but so what you have now is completely more than doubled in size of, of what was the original footprint um it, the original footprint was likely about 900 square feet and um, at least 400 square feet additions were made sometime after this of 1961 and 1970 and in the 70s. So the two structures are that main house and the casita. The main house is approximately 1,300 square feet, and the casita is about 220 square feet. And the application is to um, add on to the casita and as well add on to the main house. Um, in general, though, the main house has 18-inch thick adobe bricks, um, and the, the newer portions are frame construction. Um, the, the main house does have a sloped roof, and it's stuccoed to match. Oh, excuse me, the casita has a sloped roof. There's an angled um, roof, uh, shed roof type on the main house. Uh, they sit on about a third of an acre lot, which is one of the eight properties which was originally occupied by the Garcia family, um, several of whom still reside in the area nearby. And it's it backs up to Lorenzo Lane. It's off of Gonzales Road, so it's in that area. Um, the H Board approved this proposal back in 2011. Um, that it obviously has expired, and the owners did commence um, that project but didn't complete that. And they're back to request um, approval for the that proposal tonight. So for the main, oh, I'm gonna keep moving the. These are pictures of the house. Um, so you enter it off, uh, let's, yeah, Gonzales Road, and it's a driveway with the um, that's lined by a coyote fence. And then you can see in the lower left photo, 
And um, the, up, the top photo shows you the front door, um, which actually faces west. And then the bottom um, right photo is the, uh, the, it's the rear east elevation, the rear portal. And the casita you can see here in the in the left left side photograph um, and its relationship to the main house and the actual the west elevation of the main house you can see on the photo in the photo on the right. So this is both an existing and proposed site plan. Uh, the the darker portions are the additions. Uh, the main house footprints footprints are there. And the next one is a is a has some perspectives uh, linked to those portions of the site plan um, in terms of what they would look like. This is the, the upper left is an, is the casita. It's going to um, it'll it'll actually be a larger addition than the existing square footage. It'll be a three hundred and thirty square foot um, addition. It'll be um, have a flat roof also, and it'll they'll add a, um, exposed vegas. And the two multi-pane divided light windows will replace the existing two aluminum sliding units, as you can see in that picture. Uh, and the door will be moved to the east side of the addition. So that's the the actual casita. The main house will have an addition on its west corner, southwest corner of approximately 560 square feet. Its style will match that of the existing house in the casita with, with a flat roof, rounded corners, and parapets. Uh, the new doors will match the existing, and they will be Sierra and windows, Sierra Pacific wood-clad casements with divided lights. The height will match the existing um, with the southwest facade inset entry at 19 feet at its highest point, which matches the height of the rear northeast elevation at 15 feet. There's a four feet slope on this site. It is, um, it's, a, it's a bit challenging as far as that goes drainage. Um, I'll show you pictures are really the best way to tell this. I'm gonna come back to the elevations. So I guess I showed you the pictures. In your packet, you have a, um, an existing and proposed elevation of the entry that I just described. Um, from the elevations, if you go to this, the top left set of the southwest face, you can see the existing on the top with the slope shed roof and the casita. And on the bottom, you can see the entry, which has changed. They flattened out that uh, parapet roof line, and they've added um, this, not crenellated, what do you call that, um, stepped uh, parapet over the front keeping the vegas that are there and the addition is this uh, portion on the left that will replace this um, behind behind this addition the existing portal will be closed in as part of that addition um, let's see. now i will go back to Uh, the floor plan for the casita, which is in, um, you have a, a greater picture of this. You don't have a similar floor plan uh, for the house, but this is this is showing the casita proposed and existing, um, the, the floor plan and the and the proposed elevations. So, in sum, um, staff finds that this proposal remodel proposal meets the, the general um, H. There's general standards for the H districts as well as the downtown and east side design standards and recommends approval. Stand for questions. Angela, uh, Angela, is fencing part of this project? Thank you, Chair Rios, for that question. Yes, they plan to um, uh, put up more coyote fencing that matches what's there within the property. Are they going to add more fencing or just repair what is there? On the, they're planning to um, replace the existing flat pine fencing on the southwest side and make that coyote fencing to match the fen the fencing along the south and the west elevations, which are that the coyote the fencing that uh, lines the driveway. And then they want to add a four feet tall adobe wall at the east and west sides, um, defining the outer edges of the of the casita in the main house. And they'll they'll taper to shorter scalloped, and a in a stepped shape. 
and the stucco will be buckskin. All right. Thank you. Any other uh, clarification questions for Angela? None being a yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Angela, did you say that there is a portal being enclosed? The thank you, member. Aguilar Madrano, I was going to say Madrano Aligar, <laughs> Aguilar. Um, this portal that you see in the upper left corner is where there will be um, that addition is going. So it will fill in most of that portal. As, so that's, that's so I, I personally don't have an issue with anything that the applicant's proposing, but from, but doesn't the code say that portals can't be enclosed even if it's Regardless of its status, I know this is not contributing. So, would that require an exception technically? Uh, subject to our interpretation, as I've worked in this job for for many years and before, that applies to to uh, contributing and significant structures, and not necessarily not non contributing structures. Um, but this is a question for for us here tonight to discuss further. I have reviewed cases. And um, you all have approved cases on non-contributing buildings where they have infilled portals in the past. Okay, thank you. Unless Frank, do you want to speak to that? I was just looking at this for a different case, the code earlier, and I interpreted it as it didn't matter the status that portals were not to be enclosed. Member Aguilar Medrano and uh, Madam Chair, this issue is. Um, somewhat complex and uh, when it comes down to subsection D of code section 14-5.2 uh, some applicants have indicated that because of a preface uh, to the text in subsection D subsection D applies only uh, to contributing significant or landmark structures and does not apply to not non-contributing structures However, uh, there is another section of 14-5.2, uh, which is C3, which reads that, sorry, let's see, C4, compliance with general and specific design standards required, all development located within the historic districts and subject to section 14-5.2 shall comply with all applicable general development standards set forth in subsection 14-5.2B as well as any applicable specific development standards set forth in subsections 14-5.2 E through I. Uh, so E through I are the specific development standards that apply to the specific historic districts. Uh, downtown and east side, west side, Guadalupe, Tom Gaspar area, that sort of thing. Subsection D, at least according to what I just read, all development has to comply with subsection D under subsection D, there are specific restrictions on contributing significant and landmark structures. And then there are some restrictions that don't say they apply only to the specially protected significant landmark and um, contributing structures. So all I conclude, all I can conclude from reading that subsection four is that there are special restrictions on specially protected structures such as significant and landmark uh, and significant structures and contributing structures. And if it doesn't read that that subsection of D, such as porches and portals, applies only to those specially protected structures, they apply to all structures. Subsection four under D reads, existing porches and portals shall not be enclosed. Um, on the other hand, this is an addition and not necessarily just an enclosure. So I think it's something that the board just has to has to consider whether or not section four applies. Okay, thank you. I yeah, I only ask because I think it's going to come up again later tonight. Um, so am I understanding correctly that your interpretation is that it only applies to contributing or significant structures? Uh, well, no, my interpretation is that all structures in the historic districts must comply with subsection D unless it is specific under subsection D that that restriction applies only to significant contributing landmark structures. Subsection D4 doesn't indicate it only applies to significant contributing and landmark structures. It, it is one of the shortest subsections I've ever read. It reads, 
existing porches or port halls shall not be enclosed. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean an exception criteria can't be applied because the exceptions under subsection C do read that the board can consider or recommend exceptions to subsections 14-5.2D, 1 through 8, 10 through 11. Um, but in this case here, we're talking about an entire addition. Uh, where are we talking about the portal? Um, so if you can look at this floor plan, um, or actually it is, I guess it's a site plan. Uh, this is the addition on the main house. And this this is that uh, north west elevation that has an existing portal. And this is an addition. So it's not technically an enclosure of a portal. It's an addition. And it's an addition to a building that's non-contributing with no primary facade. Thank you. In this I, case. Didn't, I didn't mean to open a can of worms. I just want to be consistent because I know this is going to come up again later tonight. So I appreciate the a can of worms. The, absolutely. Or, okay. <laughs> the so don't feel bad. The worms are out. Thank you. The worms are out in right. reference to the ordinance, and there's a lot of portions of the ordinance that are sketchy or that are in conflict with one another. Um, yes, Member Guido. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, it's very clear that this is not an infill of a portal. This is a replacement of an existing portal with an addition. Um, just a, a note about board process. Um, the Chapter 14 very clearly gives the land use director and the land use staff the authority to interpret land use code. Um, questions, and, and you certainly have a valid question, Mag Member Aguilar Madrona, but just in terms of board process, Frank is not a judge here tonight, and the city attorney's office is not in charge of interpreting land use code. Um, it doesn't work like that in any other municipality. Uh, I think questions like this are, should be directed to, to land use staff first, um, as they're the ones who are reviewing the cases and uh, are regularly interpreting the code um, uh, and, and assisting us in making decisions here. Um, so just, just a, a point of order about that. I tend to disagree with you in reference to that. Uh, we have attorneys, an attorney that is representing the city, and that is his job to interpret. No, ma'am. Uh, Madam Chair, it is not. To interpret. It is it. not. It is the land use director's authority to, to interpret, interpret land use code. That is his job uh, to interpret the law. That's. Uh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. That's not the job of the city attorney. You can provide clarification to a particular legal issue or that, that the board may have, but that is not the city attorney's role. I can tell you there are a lot of rules that are apply to what you call statutory interpretation, which includes court uh, code interpretation. And there is a specific statute in New Mexico. And in fact, most states that I know of that tell you if there's an ambiguity in the code, this is how you resolve it. And I am applying that and trying to resolve what would otherwise be, um, you know, conflicting provisions of the code. Right? And so, um, as I have told this board before, you know, I give my advice. You will not be the first board or first client I've had that did not follow my advice. If you don't follow my advice, I'm just saying that I'm trying to avoid some problem down the road. I'm trying to avoid this becoming some bad facts create bad law of creating some precedent from the court of appeals that restricts this board or for that matter um, hinders the board in applying the code for decades which is what happens when you have bad facts going before uh, an appellate tribunal that makes sense and I, I want you to do everything according to the code so that we don't have something that hinders you later right it's clear there's not a conflict here, though. Anyway, in this particular case, as it's been indicated, but we have in the past, uh, for my recollection, that we have, um, if it's if there is an enclosure to a portal, uh, if the building was uh, not uh, designated as contributing or significant, or it wasn't a landmark, then uh, there was less restriction 
in reference to enclosing uh, a portal. That's anyway. Um, any further questions, board members? And um, did I ask for uh, a public comment? Here. For the applicant John here Eddie. this evening, excuse me. Comes forward. He's been sworn in. Madam Chair. Me Chair, if I may. Oh, yeah, I think we want to hear from the applicants first before we go to public comment, and they oh, are here in the absolutely. audience. Absolutely. Applicants, I am so sorry. If they want to speak, please come forward. My apologies to you. Uh, I am going to swear you in. Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. Mark DeFrancis, 208 Gonzalez Road, Santa Fe. Yes, sir. Well, uh, just uh, I think a note on the portal that the existing portal is going to be removed and replaced in that. See, that's going to be removed there. So that's it's all going to be a, a new um, addition there. So that is going to be removed. So, if there's any questions? Any other questions or any comments? Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, question for the applicant. Um, so I, I understand that the, the shed roof, the main mass of the house is going to be flattened. Is that, is that the case? On the casita? or On the main house. On the main house. It's all going to be flat. Okay. So it'll, the highest point will be lowered just a little bit and we get over the entry this stepped detail. Oh, in that front facade. Yes, yes. Right, that um, it's it just has that '80s kind of angle to it, mm -hmm. and we're going to just make it straight up, and then put some steps on the side. Is, is the my only my only minor comment is that you know, just given the nature of the existing building, I, I, I see this as a as a kind of contrived detail for the house. That you know, it's a bit of a kind of making the entry very fancy. Um, to what is otherwise a modest house, uh, my only question to you would would be: Would you be open a, uh, open to simplifying that step detail? You know, the parapet can be raised over the door, but maybe eliminating the kind of uh, faux storefront um, kind of super fancy aspect of that. Would you be open to that? If that pleases the board, we could do that. Sure. Thank you, sir. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Barbara Beach. Yeah, I share I share that exact concern. Um, especially from the proposed northeast view on page 13. It looks very thin, the step detail, the top, it looks like it doesn't serve a purpose. And I feel like the entrance is quite nice with the because you retained and the um the setback from the the outermost wall. I don't think it needs more. Um, so if you're willing to reconsider that detail, that would be my only comment. Sure. Yeah, we could reconsider that for sure. Any other comments or questions, board members? And uh, Mr. Eddy, did you still have a comment? Mr. Eddy. Madam Chair, board members, thank you. I appreciate the fact that uh, board member Aguilar Medrano um, brought her question to the uh, assistant attorney and I think that's completely appropriate in this board's procedures it's just my own personal opinion and I'm grateful that he's here to give you that guidance I've seen this board address uh, issues like this in the past and the board does have discretion based on adequate consultation with the assistant attorney to interpret the code the way they see fit that's my understanding of how this all works so um and I do appreciate the fact that this uh, ad addressing the entryway with a, an enhanced parapet is probably a much better way to go on this property. So I appreciate that feedback from Member Guido. Mr. Eddie, any other people from the public wishing to comment? Yes, Heather. Mr. Chair Rios, uh, Chris Grazer would like to speak. Chris, you may unmute and please state your name and address for the record. 
Good evening, Chris Grazer, 222 Gonzalez Road. And you, you need to get sworn in. Yes. Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you, board, um, and I appreciate the excellent presentation from staff. Um, I live immediately next door to this property and have for a number of years. Um, I fully support the proposed um, additions and modifications. Um, I think they will make it more attractive and more consonant with the neighborhood. Um, speaking as someone who came of age in the 1980s, I'm all in favor of getting rid of 1980s details. Um, I concur, and I am a land use attorney, although I do not represent um, these applicants. I concur that I, it's pretty clear to me that the board does have the authority um, to interpret the code to allow removal or relocation of this Porth Hall. And really, there would be no reason to keep it. You know, typically, the code is going to require details to be kept to maintain historic tech integrity. And that isn't the case here. They uh, wouldn't have had to build the house with that portal originally. There's no reason they should have to keep it with that portal. So again, I appreciate the board's time and I um, strongly encourage approval of the application as submitted. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else? Yes, um, Stephanie Beninato, uh, you may unmute. Uh, thank you, Stephanie Beninato, PO Box 1601, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I do like the uh, the suggestions um, to lower or to change the parapet at the entry. I think that will make it better. Um, I have to say that uh, I am in agreement with Mr. Eddy that the city attorney is here to uh, give advice, uh, particularly when there are ambiguous uh, parts. Ultimately, the board will make a decision, but it should be based on the city attorney's advice. It, it, you know, I mean, I don't always, as you know, agree with Mr. Rubalid, but I do think that his role needs um, some respect. And um, the city attorney is the one who has to defend your decisions. So I, I think that you at least have to address that concern if the concern is brought up as to why you're going to ignore that advice. Um, and that would be my suggestion, not in this case, because I think it's pretty clear that the portal's not being enclosed, but in other cases. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Heather. Yeah, Chair. I will entertain a motion. And please be specific in reference to the entryway. One more comment, Madam Chair. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to say this earlier. I just wanted to thank you for hanging in there all these years after you first got it approved and still wanting to make these changes and congratulations. I think it's really nice. Motion, please. I'll make a motion. Um, Case 2023-006284-HDRB-208 and 208A Gonzalez Road. Move that the board approve uh, the application as submitted uh, with the following adjustment uh, that the parapet over the front entry of the main house uh, be limited to no more uh, than 13 feet in height um, and that the stepping detail uh, be eliminated uh, and that the applicant uh, update the drawings for final staff approval. So second. Each side second. Uh, roll call vote. Member Aguilar Medrano? Yes. Member Berkeley? Yes. Member Beachside? Yes. Member Bienvenue? Yes. Member Guida? Yes. The motion has been approved. Uh, next case is located at 1170 Camino de Lora. And this is Ramon's case. Great, thank you. Uh, 1170 Camino de Loro appears to have been built about 1947. Um, we are kind of breaking this um, project up into a couple pieces. There's going to be a proposed addition, so I don't want to open up a can of worms here. You know, don't want to muddy the waters. We're only considering the status review. 
And the first page of your packet um, it has a relative relevant code citations, but I'd like to delete an application for construction or demolition as set forth in section 14-5.2. We can deal with that when it's brought to right. it's um, brought we should only order. talk about this what is before us and Correct. what's been advertised, and that's the status review. That's exactly right. So um the uh John Murphy as requested did a phenomenal job on the Hickby. I hope you had a chance to read it and go through it. It's uh really well done. Um and the project was or the building was um altered somewhat considerably from its original condition and um including removal of um, original windows. The, the house faces, the main facade faces Camino de Loro, but it's about 100 feet of pretty much blank wall with a garage kind of tucked in on the side. So that diminished its um, status from contributing to non-contributing. Um, Aside from that, well, I can show you some pictures here. That's where it is. That's that south elevation with a kind of relatively blank wall. The west elevation. The building really opens up to the north. With a portal and uh, don't get confused by this drawing. The drawing on the right is what will be proposed at a future hearing date, but on the left is the existing floor plan. And the south and east elevations. And the north and west elevations. With that, um, staff recommends that the status remain as non-contributing. Thank you, Ramon. Any questions uh, for Ramon, board members? None. Uh, will the applicant please come forward? And that's Jeff Sears. Okay. Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. Jeff, Jeff Sears, 122 Lorenzo Road. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. I'm Jeff Sears. Um, the owners and I, uh, we agree with the new HICPE, which are you, uh, you are considering tonight, and also uh, with staff's recommendation that the uh, residents, primary or the uh, main residence on this property remains non-contributing. Um, tonight, uh, via Zoom, if there's any questions on the HICP, HIP it was prepared uh, by John Murphy. Uh, he is available via Zoom to answer any questions on the HICP, and certainly I'm here to answer any other questions you may have. Any questions for Mr. Sears or for John Murphy, board members? It appears not at this moment. Anyone from the public wishing to comment on this particular project? I don't see anyone here. Is there anyone on Zoom? I don't see any hands raised, Chair Rios. There is no one on Zoom, so I will entertain a motion. Board members? I'll make a motion. Member Beachide. Um, in case 2023-006359 HDRB at 1170 Camino de Laura, I move that we um, retain the non-contributing status for the house as recommended by staff. Minister Sick. We do a second. Uh, roll call vote, please. Member Aguilar Medrano? Yes. Member Berkeley? Yes. Member Beachside? Yes. Member Bienvenue? Yes. Member Guida? Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you, Mr. Sears. Thank you. 
And uh, we'll go to case uh, to the next case on the agenda, which is located at 502 Zarius Road. Angela, this is your case. Where is she? There she is. In this case, this is located in the historic transition district. So. Thank you, Chair, members of the board. Yes, this is 502 Sirius Road in the um, historic transition district, case number uh, 006360. Now, if I can pull up my PowerPoint, um, for some reason I changed the view and I need to get back to. Madam Chair. Um, we have discussed some legal issues as to how they would be resolved if uh, it appears that we're not necessarily all on the same page, or if it appears that there may be some legal conundrum that has to be addressed. That should be done off the record among the staff and the city attorney uh, in a recess. And as much as um, I abhor the thought of uh, prolonging these hearings any longer than they need to be, it would probably be beneficial uh, to have a brief recess so I can discuss this matter with the staff. Again, with apologies for any delay that causes the hearing. May we have a recess? So you want to do that now and for... Uh... For what matter? Um, this is 502 Sirius. Road. We have discussed. Uh, I'm going to guess you want to discuss the enclosure of Portales. That is a very good guess. <laughs> you're going to leave the room. Well, or you uh, I need. How does this work? The room with the staff, so we can discuss this matter. Yes, I think that's what that's what I've been advised to do by my uh, by my boss. May we do that at this time? Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. So we're going to take um, a short recess. Yes. Mm -hmm. Without a motion. Yeah. Okay.
Can give us back our voice? Hello. Okay. Oh, I'm not connected. Do you have access to the shared drive to pull up my slides? Not on my transfer. So are you projecting? Looks like maybe I did get it, it connected me. I think I'm good now. Thank you. Okay. Ooh, tripping. Now it's back. I can advance the slides. Okay, now you can see this. Okay, pardon the delays. Um, so this case, as mentioned, is 502 Cerritos Road. It's non-contributing in the historic transition district. Uh, the proposal, or excuse me, the building itself is a is at the corner of uh, Cerritos Road and Manhattan. What you're seeing at the top is at that corner from the east elevation from the east, or you're looking at its east elevation. Um, below is that front east elevation, and then the, the uh, north elevation fronts Manhattan. And this is, this is the north elevation, which is along Manhattan Street. And this is the below photograph shows the, the step backs of the existing um, north elevation as well. So the applicant, um, this is the site plan with the front over here facing Sirius Road. This is parking and there's a low yard wall here. Okay, the applicant proposes to, uh, well, sorry, I didn't, just the history of this building. Um, it was built in 1973, um, according to the historic uh, survey, it uh, was built as the the Shafani Brothers Printing Company, uh, and then most recently was an audio video store, a sound look. It's made of concrete block. Um, it has flat roofed masses of varying heights, ranging from 10 feet, 14, uh, and to 14 feet, nine inches at the northwest corner. It has battered parapets and wood and metal canales and metal downspouts. Um, the windows, some are a mix of six over six wood double hung units with metal storm windows and steel casements um, on the facades of the west end of the north wall. And um, its street facing front elevation has these 12 light fixed recessed windows that are uh, these, these guys right here. Um, there is also... Um, Evidence, there's been alterations to the building in particular under this uh, enclosure. It, the front entrance here and the windows there, I believe are, are more modern doors that have been replaced. So what the applicant is proposing is to shift. So we're at the floor plan here. 
uh, shift the entrance of the building um, from under this enclosure to here, which will be to the southwest, and um, increase the wall or the, excuse me, the building height, it'll be increased uh, to 14 feet, three inches for that main entrance. And the, and the signage is a separate uh, application that should, that's not before you here tonight. Um, the maximum allowable height is 14 feet, three inches in this streetscape. Uh, the Southern end parapet will be raised from 12, from 12 feet, five inches to 13 feet two. as you, uh, let's see, let me get to an elevation to show you the different uh, parapet heights existing. Okay, so we're looking at this this east facade. This is the existing above and the proposed below. And this is this is the parapet that's going to be raised a little bit here, as well as this this parapet. Um, the applicant proposes to enclose the eighty four square foot uh, entry portal on the east elevation. That's this, and. Um, the existing dark metal clad divided light windows underneath there will be replaced. These will be replaced with dark bronze anodized finished aluminum frame windows. Um, on the there'll be new commercial grade metal doors on the north elevation um, to it, it, at the loading dock. Um, and for this building too, they plan to um, it's a re, it's a full re roof. The uh, they also propose to add. A uh, to the north elevation, a um, at that north corner, a patio area, and and um, and and a trellis over that. The patio will be about three hundred and sixty-two square feet, and it's it is between the building and the current existing yard wall. Um, and adding that shade structure, which consists of of steel columns and steel beam with a peeled wood latia covering. Um, so the the front elevation wall, excuse me, the front yard wall is very, it's two feet, eight inches, runs to up to four feet, three feet, th four feet, three inches. They are proposing to add about three inches to that west end yard wall um, to that. And the both of the proposed heights of the yard walls are within the maximum allowable height for yards, yard walls and fences in this streetscape. And part of the proposal is to add a wooden steel gate to the east yard wall. And the stucco will be buckskin. As I stated, signage is a separate application. Um, and having gone through all of that, staff finds that the application does comply with section 14-5.2D, the general design standards for all historic districts and the Historic Transition District Standards, Section 14-5.2F. With that, I stand for questions. Any questions for Angela, board members? It appears no questions at this time. Um, will the applicant or applicants please come forward? Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. Hello, my name is Edward Fitzgerald. I'm an architect, live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I've been working for the Allingers on this project. And Mr. Fitzgerald, what do you have to add to what Angela just told us? Um, she did a pretty good job of describing it. Uh, I th I'd say that what um, we were trying to do is we were trying to, because it's a trans transitional zone, and we felt that it did have some of that Santa Fe Pueblo style to it, and yet it was transitional and was a little bit more industrial towards the uh, rail yard, and it is a distillery. The idea was to pull from the rail yard a little bit and pull from, you know, maybe the historic part of Santa Fe a little bit and try to meld the two together. And I think some of the materials like to have a steel beam, but then to have wood latias on it, you know, can be make that kind of combination. So it was trying to, um, I would say, aesthetically be pleasing uh, to and 
consistent with what I think of the Santa Fe Pueblo revival style and yet pull from maybe more of an industrial feel that the railroad has in that area. Thank you. Um, board members, any questions for Mr. Fitzgerald? I, I'm Madam Chair, I have a question. Mr. Green. Thank you. Um, just a quick question about the proposed material for the patio wall. Um, is that wood stucco. fence? It's stucco. it's stucco. So in when we look at the oh on the excuse me, you're right on the side facing uh Cerios, we want yes. to do that board formed concrete. Board formed concrete, okay. But then along this along Manhattan. Manhattan, it's all stucco. Stucco. So I was trying to introduce some what I guess I'd call contemporary, but kind of minimalist contemporary, which I, I see the board form concrete as having texture and material, but it is, uh, um, you know, kind of consistent with the stucco material. Uh, but it's just that small portion facing. It's the. Um, it's just the small portion facing Cerios yeah, would the, be board form concrete. Yeah. The, yeah it's just it just is it goes along the side of that um hello oh. it's it's this portion down here that goes from the corner of the building out towards that got it got it i see i see now on the side that, plan. that tower that's up. yeah and the the gate in that wall would, would be the material of that it's um, a steel frame with horizontal wood slats that would be spaced okay great thank you any other questions uh, member Aguilar -Metrano. thank you madam chair the one thing i brought up during our field trip today was just that this year marks this building's 50th year, um, meaning it, you know, it's historic. And so I brought up the issue of does it warrant a status review? Um, staff's response to that was, I think she echoed that tonight also that Angela thought too many changes had been done to consider a status review. Um, but looking at the historic building inventory form, they have it as minor degree of remodeling. And just looking at that photo, maybe the door may change, but the window openings appear to stay the same. The portal is still there. And so I'm still just questioning whether before we approve a significant number of changes to what may be a primary facade, if it were deemed contributing, if that's something we should visit. Uh, the other things I noticed, um, there is a decent amount of metal siding that's proposed on this building. And even in the historic transition district, there is specific language that says metal panels are not allowed. So if I'm understanding correctly, the metal paneling is behind the words distillery, and then it's also in the area where the existing portal is. And I'm also a little confused at how, so the detail calls out that the words distillery or, or leaves are cut out of this metal paneling and that it has galvanized steel behind it. So I'm a little confused at how we can separate the issue of signage from this proposal if the metal paneling in itself, as it's being presented tonight, has the signage incorporated into it. So I don't know if An Angela, maybe you wanna clarify how those two are being separated. Uh, thank you, board member. I'm going to refer to, I'm going to defer to Ed on that one as far as the design exactly. Okay. Well, it, um, you, you go further because I had examples, I think, at the end of the material to cut out. Oh, it's in there, your packets. Thing. I didn't put that in the slideshow. I think Top in the level. packets, it's there's an example of it, of the steel with the cutouts. So, Please. you know, it's like a steel sheet. And then it's a laser cutout, and then behind it, so there's a contrast. No, I, you read distillery. Yeah, I understand what it is. Angela had just said that we are not um, hearing the case on signage tonight, but I would consider, you know, this distillery portion is signage. So 
how can we approve that metal siding if we did without getting into the signage? I just don't know how the two cases can be separated. If I may, I will uh, interject that um, I'm going to pose the question to the applicant whether this proposal that says distillery that 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 um, this this particular elevation isn't what is before you tonight because they have to go through um, the other case on the signage. So, is that the case? Are you proposing distillery on that wall? We've eliminated that possibility already. Well, what do you advise? It can't be a sign right now. Can't be a sign right now? And it's not approved. So could we just say that it's the rusted metal without the cutout letters at this point? I, I don't know. In my mind, I think it's hard to separate those two. I guess the first question is if the board wants to approve the metal siding, which the code clearly states isn't allowed even in the historic transition district. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm just wanted to start the conversation about that and bring it to other members' there, attention. But there, are, yeah, um, I think that there are a couple of buildings down along the rail yards that have that Cortan steel on it. It could be. My understanding was that this building was right on the cusp of the district, so it could be that you have one very close by that has that. But as we're considering it tonight, this building is in the historic transition district, and and that's what the code says regarding metal siding. So I think we just have to abide by that. Member Bimadim. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, just following up on the last couple comments. Um, I yeah, I was I couldn't figure out exactly where the metal siding was. I saw this, the sample, but now so just could you identify every place that you're talking about putting metal siding? Just the microphone, Ed. So th this new entrance here, it's clad in the metal. And then, Mr. Fitzgerald, if I might interrupt you, uh, when you're saying this entrance here, if you can tell us what the elevation is, because uh, so it would be. It's, it's the front the elevation. Okay. Mm -hmm. East. And where are we moving the entrance to there? That's clad in the steel. Are you saying that from um, from the street level up to the parapet or just yes. where the sign? Uh, okay. Yes. And then over here, at the infill, there are metal panels there, and they have the street uh, address cut out of them. Okay. So it was a way to kind of bring the graphics into it, like with the street numbers, <clears throat> the name distillery. So, okay. Um, yeah. So the steel trellises, I'm okay with. I think everyone knows that I don't agree with that kind of feature in the downtown and historic east side district, but I think that it is okay for where you're proposing it in the transition district, because that is uh, semi-industrial. Um, but as was just pointed out by member Aguilar Madrano, there are two um, provisions in the code that I think you're running up against. One is, no, it literally says no metal siding in the historic transition district. And then secondly, it says no concrete walls. So I think you have two, two uh, materials issues here that are directly contrary to the code standards. So um, you would have to, I believe, have a qualify for exceptions for both of those in this instance. So it's pretty much stucco or stucco or stucco? Yeah. It specifically Maybe. calls out walls and fences, uh, walls of unstuccoed concrete block or unstuccoed concrete are prohibited. I mean, it's black and white. No, but I'm just asking, is yeah, stucco needs... the only material that's approved for this? Uh, Maybe built of brick, adobe, rock, masonry, wood, coyote fencing, wrought iron, slump block, or similar materials. It's specifically well, a masonry material or stucco because you know how wood gets beat up right. if you try to do like a wood siding i think it would be really good. right that's what i like about steel in new mexico it's like this shell protective shell that does really well with the weather here mm. and it patinas to where it blends into the landscape in a beautiful beautiful ways with the green of the foliage and mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, right. Well, that's why it's everywhere you look in Albuquerque. And <laughs> this is an architect because I thought it would be beautiful and it would Tina and it would age well. Right. I understand it's very common. It's very common, especially for things like distilleries and coffee shops and so forth and so on. It's just specifically called out in this district as being prohibited. Any so. other questions or comments, board members? Anyone from the public wishing to comment? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, board members, John Hitty speaking again. I don't want uh, board member Aguilar Madrano's suggestion that the board be considering the 50 year rule here. I'm worried that you're going to overlook that. And I think that's very important right now. So I'm wondering if maybe a, a postponement should be called on this or if the board wants to consider a status review, et cetera. I don't, you know, I think the board needs to address that without moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eddy. Any other persons from the public wishing to comment? Yes, Ms. Beninato would like to speak. Stephanie, you may unmute. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie Beninato, I agree with Mr. Eddy and um, with member Aguilar Medrano that um, I think if it's 50 years old or just about there, that there should be a status review while uh, these changes are being asked. And um, if it's prohibited to have metal siding, then yes, I think an exceptions or exceptions would be needed and there'd be a postponement anyway. And although it may be a block or so from the rail yard itself, um, and it's always been, I, I wouldn't say industrial looking, but not really, it's never been residential use, that's for sure. But right down the whole, that whole street before you get to Hotel um, Santa Fe, there are a lot of very small homes or what were homes, and there may be one or two left, but um, that are still there and still of that small character. And I think just to say, well, I'm close to the rail yard so I can make it industrial is just appropriating um, features from a different district in a different way. So I, I kind of um, think we need to be careful about that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, oh, what if I could say one more thing, by the way, it, um, people are forgetting to put up the visuals while people are talking about it. So this case got up very late. The last case, the visuals never got up. So it, it would really be helpful for people, particularly on Zoom, to be able to see the visuals while they're being talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Heather. Well, in this case, uh, let's see what the board wants to do. There does appear to be different issues that need to be ironed out. So let's see where this takes us. Uh, if there are no further comments, uh, I will entertain a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I mean, it kind of appears to me that we may not be able to approve this as presented because the exceptions were not called for, and I, I would appreciate staff and legal's opinion on that. Um, and and I appreciate the the comment about the age of this building because it does seem like a very drastic change to a building that um, we may risk losing without any sort of documentation or consideration of its um, contribution otherwise. So maybe, Angela, if you don't mind addressing the exceptions, that'd be great. Member Beachai, thank you. Uh, the, as we all know, the, the HICP says 1973, we're in early 19, we're in early, uh, 2023, it could have been later in the year, minor, but that is a threshold. Um, my evaluation was that um, going on that, that it was 
hadn't reached that threshold per se, combined with changes to it, um, not on that front facade, but on the north facade windows, since the Hickpea, the windows have been replaced. They're like single, or excuse me, they're large paned, amber reflective. Um, so that's a change to the building. Um, I was mostly interested in your opinion about the materials and the material. Yes. And I will, I, I believe I've, I've not done, I've not reviewed a lot of buildings in the historic transition district, and I know you're going to see more. And um, I was under the impression that metal siding was not, um, well, first of all, I didn't think it was metal sided to the degree that it really is. And I think metal is part of the, some of the buildings in this district. However, the standards expressly say no metal siding. And um, the way that it's presented and proposed here tonight, the kind of metal siding that is proposed is not, does not meet the code. Um, so, um, yeah, I think this is an eye opener. And, you know, I'm going to go out and since this is my last meeting, um, I know there's a lot of work ahead and needs to be done on this code. And in particular, I'd look at this district um, because it is transition and it is now really going to be coming before you. And uh, so it deserves a lot of thought. And maybe as such, uh, we do have um, research ongoing about the sur for surveys for the buildings in this area. It's just not been formalized or adopted for you all to see. So unfortunately, that is the that's where this building lies, literally. It's on the edge of the historic transition district. Um, yes, it's on a street with residential houses. It's clearly more of a residential office scale. Um, but I, I don't want to go any further other than to say you guys can sort this out going forward, please. Uh, yeah, I just quick clarification on the east facade. I do believe I know which windows you were talking about that have been replaced. And I think those were on the north facade. There were three larger pane windows that did appear to be newer. However, there did appear to be a number of windows that may have been original to the building. They were wood uh, painted brown. They were on the I believe they they were on the east facade, but I think there were also some on the north. So I think it's I think it's still in question as whether you know some of the materials to me appear that they could have been original to the house from 1973. Um, but I think that's a question that we need to explore a bit more, perhaps. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I, I would strongly agree with members of the board who pointed out the. Uh, transition district standards uh, conflicts with what's proposed um, and the standards I, I for sure tonight we can't you know rule on this case um I, I I do want to just kind of flag um this is the historic transition district um the, uh you know in doing work with the applicant staff can also look at this issue a little bit further but for me, um, you know, this is not a remarkable building, um, and it's not in the downtown and east side historic district. Um, it may be 50 years old, but um, I, I don't see much there beyond that. And, and I would personally um, be challenged to hold up a commercial applicant um, to such a degree for a, a, a full status review. This is in the purview of city staff, though, um, and I'd ask them to, to look at it outside the meeting. Also, to look at um, this issue of and, and work with the applicant as to whether um, they want to propose a, a redesign in terms of the materials uh, or if they want to seek exceptions um, to come before the board again. And I think that that should be the basis of a motion tonight. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, yeah, I always hate to send people back to do more work when, it, you know, they weren't expecting that, but clearly we need to evaluate this if it's coming before us for exceptions so it's already going to be delayed my question is if it were delayed for a status review as well which i think is could go either way because i'm looking at this i find it hard to imagine that we're going to we would designate it as contributing but on the other hand there's the argument for prudence before we allow changes to be made once in the structure does become historic uh just to be certain that we're not making an irre irrevocable mistake. So with that, the question is, what would be the soonest they could come back before us 
if we were to ask for a status review? How long, did, what's the shortest period of time that could be done? Uh, board member Bienvenue, that, that, I mean, it wouldn't be two weeks from now. It would be at the earliest, uh, the end of March or really the first meeting in April. And this is all up to the applicant as far as how they wish to proceed and how soon that they could find out more information on the history and provide that, should that be required. So for example, it doesn't need to be re-noticed. Um, that's not a requirement for status review at this point. It it would need it would to be, be. remitted. Yeah, that would need to be the first case, if not the first part of a case. Okay, yeah. but it could still be done. So if, uh, the motion was to defer to a date certain for status review, potential redesign and or request for exceptions. What would be the date certain that that could be that could be put into the motion? I believe that date's March 27th. I'm not I'm not certain. I'll defer to Heather on that. Carrios, member Bienvenue. I believe that the earliest it could be is the first part of April. With reference to the New Mexican newspaper ad, it's a typically a three-week lead time for us to get it to the paper. And um we so it would either be March 28th or the beginning of April, just depending upon um, the turnaround that's available to the applicant, also uh, in terms of getting that information. Would that be the same for if it were only being deferred for re request for exceptions? With the request for exception of public notice is still required, and we've already noticed with the New Mexican for the 14th of March. So we would have to at least go a month out. Okay, great. Well, that makes it easy in my mind. Thank you. Okay, so anything further, board members? Member Beach, I Just another comment on that topic. I mean, we approved several projects tonight that did not have a new HICP. I don't, in my opinion, I don't think we need to require the applicant to go through the effort of having a full HICP, knowing that the HICPs we have in the packet from 97 and 84 clearly demonstrate that this is always a commercial building, it's siding, it's garages. Um, I think there's no question like this isn't a house that's being converted to a business. I think that we should keep that in mind, um, you know, what that would really change in terms of what's being proposed. It's a little bit backwards, but um, I, I don't really see a need for that kind of detail to tell us that it's always been kind of this commercial structure. Um, I think it would be helpful, and I'm not, suggesting either that the applicant changed the materials. I think that having the explanations of why those materials were chosen, um, you know, such as the, the con, um, continuity with the rail yard materials, like that kind of detail um, and philosophy behind your design choices is really helpful to us and um, certainly can be granted through an exception. We're just sort of stuck with the, the code that prohibits it explicitly. Um, we need to know, um, you know, why, why you think the exception is, should be granted and how that criteria is met. So not to discourage a, a complete change of this project, but just a, a reformatting. Thank you. So Member Beachside, I'm interpreting your comments as indicating that there that you don't uh, think that a status review is yeah. Yeah, I don't in order. I don't think it would change my opinion. Um, I don't think a detail, you know, a detailed new John Murphy status review as lovely as those are to read is is something that would reveal much more than we know from the current information unless there's something surprising but <laughs> member benvenu um well thank you madam chair so is it, i and I, I thought you were saying that status review without the requirement of a full hick but you're saying you don't even think a status review is necessary okay i i personally think that if we're delaying it anyway that there's no harm in doing a status review because we haven't even received a recommendation from staff i think i know what it would be potentially but i would like to see a full staff report i agree i don't think a hit a john murphy style hit is necessary in this case but if we're if we're going to be re-reviewing this case i think it'd be nice to designate it so i'd be in favor of a status review and request for exceptions and or Redesign, sure. <laughs> okay, I can form that in the way, but in the 
form of a motion, if that's okay with everyone, no other comments. Then in case 2023-006-360 HDRB at 502 Cerritos Road, I move that this case um, be deferred, um, tabled, and def well, deferred to the next most, the next soonest meeting possible, which would either be the March 28th meeting or the first meeting in April, depending on staff's final determination for a status review, specifically noting that uh, additional HICBI is not required by the board, but the applicant always has the right to undertake that process if they so desire. And a request for exceptions and or redesign to eliminate the need for exceptions. Is there a second to this motion? Aguilar Madrano seconds. Anything further to add? Further, uh, roll call vote, please. Um, <clears throat> Member Aguilar Madrano? Yes. Member Berkeley? Yes. Member Beachside? Yes. Member Bienvenue? Yes. Member Guida? Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you. So, applicant, we shall see you um, at another date. Thank you. Uh, is the applicant or applicants here for case? Um, Located at 1564 Canyon Road. Cherry is members of the board. He is not. Okay, so I would ask for us to um, have a motion that would place this case on a future agenda. I think there's a Preston. Oh, sorry, there. From Preston? Yes. Okay, he's on Zoom. He's on Zoom. So the applicant oh. is participating by Zoom. So oh. let me pull up that presentation. The applicant is on Zoom, so we'll go forward with uh, this case. Yes, the applicant has his hand raised, and so he is there and can talk after um, Angela's presentation. Heather, I my computer is threatening to shut down. Um, I might need you. Oh no! I know the slides. It's an work. update. It's just one moment. Let me. I'll try again. Let's see. So, fifteen sixty-four. I have. Nine minutes. <clears throat> okay, I think it came up on mine, unless that's you. It's not letting me do anything with it. You can see that troublesome little box there. It won't let won't let. All me. right, go ahead and share this. I have nine minutes. <laughs> okay. Just just to be sure. Okay. Okay, so this case is a solar project in the downtown and east side historic district. It is um property you all have seen before. It has a round adobe house on the rear, which you all designated on contributing in a previous case and approved a remodel in addition onto that, as well as a carport. And this proposal is to add um, two solar arrays, one on top roof mounted on the new, um, on the new, uh, the addition. Let me go to the slide. So orientation is Canyon Road. It's set pretty far back this road goes around and the roundhouse is, is in this part and it's been added on the applicant proposes um solar roof mounted solar there and the applicant is proposing a ground mounted solar um, structure where the other star is um and this just gives you a um, more of a bird's eye view um as you're looking from north from excuse me from canyon road back towards really Picacho's back, Picacho and the, the Santa Fe watershed. That's the roundhouse that has a little um, addition. And that's one, again, I'll just say it again. That's where the roof mounted solar is to go. And this is the other site for the ground mounted. Um, oops, solar fixtures. Um, So 
So the, the rooftop will be eight panels um, and the panels are gonna be um, below the parapet. They'll be, they'll be at an angle, but in your packet, there's a yellow graph paper elevation showing that those panels. Um, the uh, ground mounted system will have 12 solar panels and it, the structure will be um, go from two feet at its bottom or lowest point up to six feet at the at the north end, obviously facing south. Um, the ground mounted panels are located approximately 130 feet from the roundhouse, which you've seen on the aerial and the plan um, near the, the new PM utility meter. So the reason this comes to the board is because it is a new structure in the downtown and Eastside Historic District, as well as it's possible public visibility in the future because it currently is screened by trees um, pretty far back. So staff's perspective is that this is um, this meets standards and is entirely approvable. So downtown and Eastside Historic Districts, as well as the, 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 the districts for, excuse me, the standards for um, all the age districts. So, like that concludes my report. So yeah, my question was gonna be about public visibility. So you feel that uh, this is far from Canyon Road, but there's a possibility that if there was no, there were no trees, then this could be, the solar panels could be seen. Terrius, that's correct. Could be. It's not now. There's trees there, uh, and it's not that it couldn't be screened in the future, but it would be maybe a portion of it would be publicly visible from Canyon Road, Upper Canyon Road. Any other questions for Angela, board members? Um, will the applicant please get sworn in? Preston, you may have mute, and please state your name and address for the record, and then you'll be sworn. Uh, my name is Preston Bastardo, and my physical address is here in Taos, New Mexico, but I'm representing the app or Kate Lopez at 1564 Canyon Road. Thank you. Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. And sir, do you have anything further to add to what Angela just told us? Uh, well, I first wanted to apologize for not being here when it was first presented. Uh, but uh, as far as it being able to be seen, I guess from from Canyon Road, the way that the property is, is kind of uh, terraced and kind of goes up the hill. And and it does have some trees behind the, the ground mounted portion of the array. Um, but if those trees weren't there uh, at any portion on the road, that's kind of, I guess, within, well, I guess at any portion of the road, I, I don't see how you could see the array from from the, the road area. But um, other than that, I, I think it's pretty straightforward and Angela presented what needed to be presented. Thank you. Uh, board members, any questions for the applicant? Appears they have no questions right now. Uh, anyone from the public wishing to speak on this particular case? No one here, anyone on Zoom? Yes, Stephanie Beninato would like to speak. Stephanie, you may unmute. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, um, I remember this case and um, I support solar, but I would be concerned about it um, being visible and I, I just had a question because I thought that in the east side downtown that solar wasn't I wouldn't say not allowed but certainly had not could should not be seen from a public way um, and again I guess we're not supposed to consider trees as was said and so maybe screening now uh, as opposed to later might be okay but uh, I, I, I just, um, again, am, am concerned about public visibility uh, and wonder about, um, wonder about the view, like if you were going up the canyon, would you be able to see um, these uh, solar arrays? I, I wonder about that, not just from Canyon Road itself. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on Zoom? No, Chair, we no? 
Uh, Member Benvenu. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> yeah, the code is interesting um, because for every other district, there's a specific provision for solar devices, whether it's um, for hot water or for solar electricity, <clears throat> and but except for these downtown and east side. So it's just a peculiarity. I suppose you could make the argument that that implies it's different in that um, district and, and they're not encouraged, whereas they're specifically called out as being encouraged in every other district. I tend to think, though, it's just an anomaly of the fact that the code was amended to add these other districts in later. So to me, the same rules that apply to every other district with respect to the solar array should apply here. And it's quite specific, and I think it could just be adapted as a condition here, which is the solar equipment shall be screened in ground solar collectors by a wall or vegetation. I mean, it's crystal clear. So in this case, it appears that it already is, but I, I would just make as a condition of approval that it be screened by vegetation and or a wall now and in perpetuity from public view. And I think that solves all the problems. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to point out that we we have approved um, at least three ground-mounted solar arrays at um, St. John's, Adelaide Elementary School, and at Asike Madre Elementary School. Um, just for the record, those are not screened. They're very visible from all those major roads. That's Yeah, that's interesting. I wasn't involved, but were they exceptions? I don't... I know the elementary schools were um, financed by Capital Outlay. I don't know if that makes a difference, but and I'm not sure about St. John's. Yeah, there's, there's no rule to make an exception to in the district, in the, mm. at least in yeah, the, that's uh, true. Of the, of the mm -hmm. Another uh, aspect of the oddity of the way the codes been constructed. So, any other comments or questions, board members? If not, I will entertain a uh, motion. Oh, I would like to. I guess I was just going to add one more thing about the the vegetation. Uh, there's kind of multiple layers of vegetation. So directly behind that ground mount, there's a, it's on top of a hillside that kind of drops. And then, you know, you go down the driveway and then it drops again to, to Canyon Road where, where there's, you know, taller trees along, along that hillside, along the road. And then on the west side, there's, you know, tall trees bordering the neighbor's property that kind of helps with that vegetation blockage. And then of course the south side, the, the homeowner owns to the south and then there's national forest that borders. So just another addition. Thank you. Anything further, sir? Nope, thank you. Okay. Um, motion, please. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion. Um, and before I do, I, I'll just say that, you know, I think um, Member Beachhead's right. We talked about this before uh, with the Adelaide case specifically. Um, you know, I mean, beyond the climate emergency, beyond the alignment with the values of the architecture that we're attempting to uh, celebrate in Santa Fe, um, you know, I'd rather look at this than somebody's RV or van or, you know, and, and, and they're really the same scale. Um, and, uh, you know, as long as we're not dressing up in 1920s clothes to parade around in the East side historic district, I don't think that's the pretense. Um, this is something that's clearly of its time and place and, and, uh, and can be visible. Um, uh, I'll note in the motion though, the, the vegetation point that, um, member Bienvenu made, um, the motion will be uh, case 2023-006286 HDRB, uh, 1564 Canyon Road. Uh, I move that the board approve the project as submitted, noting that uh, for the ground mounted solar, uh, there is existing vegetation uh, that screens um, that from public visibility. So second. Each I have a second. 
Anything further to add? Nothing further. Um, roll call vote, please. Mm -hmm. Member Aguilar Medrano? Yes. Member Berkeley? Yes. Member Beachside? Yes. Member Bienvenue? Yes. Member Guida? Yes. The motion has been approved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have Thank finished. You. Okay. And we will go to anything under discussion items. Heather? Yes, so it is almost that time of the year for the um, Preservation Awards. The Historic Santa Fe Foundation and Nicole met. I was unable to make that meeting, but I will be joining in on the future ones to start planning that. We would like to ask the board to um, make some recommendations of cases that you might know. Uh, we, we include um, cases from the Historic Districts Review Board, but also from the Archaeological Review Committee. And so I'll be asking them if uh, they have some nominations. Uh, it would be nice if the board, now as we get more details as to the date, I would like to, to share that with you so we so the board members can hand out the awards, which would be fantastic. So, um, but if you could put your thinking caps on, if there's something, if you have some questions regarding a project, whether it's finished, um, then be happy to, um, help you out with any questions you might have. And <clears throat> Heather, are you going to give us a deadline? Um, or an approximate deadline? If you can possibly get it to be my March 15th, so that's two weeks. Um, I think we have a little more time, but I'm just allowing a little extra time for us to do research if we need to. Thank you. Oh, are you going to give us the categories? Or do we access that online? I can email that to you. I don't have those off the top of my head, but there's definitely the Sarah Melton Award. Um, with no, there's lots of different categories. Right. Okay. <laughs> and uh -huh. there are other award, um, other categories. So uh, I will email this to you. Okay. Thank you. Anything further? Uh, at this time now. Thank you, Chairman. It seems like your uh, the staff is reducing by a lot. Yes, <laughs> I heard That's Angela say this is my last meeting. That's Angela. right, it is her last for this time around. Right, <laughs> I'm a boomerang too, like Heather. So, Angela, thank you for your time also on the board, on the board on the preservation staff. My pleasure. Thank you all, and thank you so much for your service and your thoughtful all of it. It's hard stuff, but yeah, can't do it without you all. Member Benvenu. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I did before we break, as <laughs> I know everyone's anxious to go, but I do have a question. So I saw that um, our code amendment on exceptions is coming before the Planning Commission. And I was surprised to see that you're basically proposing exactly what we rejected. Um, without any indication that we had that we had a motion to approve a different mod, uh, revision. So I'm just, I guess I'd like an explanation, but I'm kind of assuming that what you're doing is soliciting recommendations from both of those two bodies and that they'll both be presented in the, to the governing body at some point. Is that, is that your thinking? Chair Rios, um, member of the uh, yes, we're soliciting um, recommendations from both bodies. One of the things that we did do when we were studying it with Nicole Thomas was that we do at a minimum need to reorganize things. So as it was staff's recommendation previously to the H board, and the H board was very clear in direction to staff, um, we are retaining the staff recommendation for the uh Planning Commission. I will have to note, though, that um, I was made aware that the um, the proposed text amendment actually has to be introduced at City Council first, mm. and so it will be postponed from the Planning Commission uh, meeting. So I felt uh, I, I thought it was going to operate much like a, a rezone in which it does not have to be introduced, but it does um, in this particular case. So it likely will be heard um, the second meeting well, if it has to be introduced not heard until April by the Planning Commission. And will there be discussion about the board's point of view when you and present report, this to yes. the Planning Commission? Yes. 
So just to, and thank you, John, for bringing this up. Just, just to clarify, it gets introduced to city council, but then it gets then it goes to planning. planning commission for a re detailed review. Yes. It will be public comment. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. And then it will go to the governing body. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And in the meantime, are any of the cases that we've made recommendations for approval of exceptions moving forward to the city council agenda? Yes, um, member Beachide. So uh, the case for St. John's College went um, last time to city council and was approved. Uh, the case for 462 Arroyo Tenorio is going to be scheduled for the next council meeting. And, um, you know, the recommendation from the board is approval. Uh, the governing body, mostly their question was, why are we seeing this? And so they were happy to hear that there's a text amendment that is in process. So, uh, so anyway, the, there will be one or two more that 110 Calle La Pena was one of them. And, um, 220 Rodriguez. I need to review the record, but I think as it ended up, there were no exceptions necessary based on what was approved by the board. So I don't think that we'll need to see 220 Rodriguez. Thank you for moving that forward. Appreciate it. Anything else? How's the rewrite coming along? <laughs> I know that'll open uh, a yes. lot of. So um, discussion. the interviews with the different consultants have been uh, concluded, uh, or I'm sorry, the different boards and commissions, as well as stakeholders. Um, the last one we had was on Monday with the Archaeological Review Committee chair. And so we will, they're going to be doing an assessment and then creating a document of sort of the key issues that need to be addressed. Um, as well as recommendations on the first steps or the structural changes and the clarifications. So um, that summary report will be due back to us um, midsummer, probably well May, and then um, we will also be holding a second open house uh, because it was forced to be a virtual open house. It was originally anticipated in person. The staff decided to hold an in-person open house um, in April. Uh, the dates are still being confirmed with um, Convention Center for Space, but I will let you know um, as to when that will be, just so that people can be sure to be able to see all the exhibits and everything. Thank you. As was Member Benvenu the only one that was um, involved? No. There are some comments that I would like to make, but I heard you say that it was kind of closed. Uh, Chair Rios, feel free to send comments to me. That's fine. Um, just because in your absence, um, Member Aguilar Madrano was there. So, but we certainly would love your comments. You. And the rest of the board, if you want to make any comments, there is a website. It's um, the Santa Fe LDC update.org. And there's a survey on there. And, um, you know, with that email regarding the historic preservation awards, I will include that in there as well. So that if you want to go ahead and fill out your own survey, you can do so. Madam Chair, I have one yes. question for Heather. Heather, um, how, 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 how much in advance do the agendas get posted to PrimeGov? For, for for HDRB hearings. HDRB, it's uh, the agendas get posted, and maybe I can have Amanda help with that. But um, we, I think, it's fifteen days before we have a draft agenda, okay. and then um, and then we refine it, and of course, do the package sure. the Friday before. But maybe Amanda. And confirm that for me. And I don't know if you've noticed, but Amanda's been participating more um, and um, will be providing additional support for this board. So, and does everybody know Amanda Romero? Yes. Okay. Great. Hello. So the um, the agendas go uh, two weeks prior to uh, the hearing date. 
So for the March 14th hearing, they've already uh, been submitted on this past Sunday's paper. And then March 6th, we will make a determination for the next hearing, and that will go for the 28th hearing. Thank you, Thank you Amanda. And so just to be clear, the, the link on PrimeGov can be found for the particular hearing agenda two weeks in advance of the hearing? Yes, so okay. the link will be put in for the original um, paper. So when it goes into the New Mexican, it also gets posted. Will be sent there. Got it. Thank you very much. That that's helpful. Anything else, board members? If not, is someone ready to make a motion to adjourn? Please. Wait a second. Member Aguilar Medrano. Yes. Member Berkeley. Yes. Member Beachside. Yes. Member Bienvenue. Member Guida. Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you. Good night, everybody.